Okay, uh, good morning and welcome everyone to the 30th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Well, we've got apologies from Jenny Goldruth this morning, unfortunately she's not able to be with us. And also before we move to agenda item one, can I just put on the record that Andy Whiteman's got commitments at another committee this morning and may have to, to leave from time to time to, to honour those commitments. So no disrespect is meant to uh, the witnesses at committee this morning when uh, Mr Whiteman's got to go and uh, deal with his commitments elsewhere. So that said, can we move to agenda item one, which is draft budget scrutiny 2018-19. Uh, the committee will take evidence in the Scottish Government draft budget 2019 and welcoming Tony Keane, Policy Manager, Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers, and David Stewart, Policy Lead, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, and also Douglas Black, Secretary, Local Government Services Group, and Mark Ferguson, Chair, Local Government Committee, Unison Scotland. You, you, you're all very welcome. There's there's no open statements. It might just um, some brief housekeeping. My apologies to our Unison representatives this morning if we dwell on housing for the first section of the of the. Of course, feel free to come in on relation to that. But we'll maybe we'll focus on housing a little bit more at the start of our what 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 evidence session and and then move on. So just to ask for a, a degree of latitude and patience there. Um, so maybe just a, a general, uh, very general question to open opening up. Um, I'm just back from a, a, a breakfast briefing about cuts to to local authorities that, that, that SPICE and partners at Glasgow University and Heriot Watt University, uh, an analysis they've done uh, uh, in relation to cuts to local government. But one of the areas that it would appear that it's not a cuts-based agenda would be in relation to uh, the Housing Association movement register social landlords, including local authorities that are in the business of building and, and giving subsidies to houses. So um, can, can I ask our housing representatives to me give what their feeling is in relation to the financial environment, uh, certainly in the last financial year, in terms of the affordable housing budget for Scotland? Mr. Keane. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it would be wrong to say that reductions in local authority resources haven't had an impact on the housing function w within councils. The, those bits of the activity that are funded from rents remain as robust as the housing revenue account business plan and the capacity of tenants to pay rents to fund services. But non-HRA services, particularly around homelessness, support services uh, and services around social care, have all seen reductions in capacity and they have a bearing and they have an impact on the clients in council housing and, and therefore on the housing service itself. But I think the other area where there have been... Where significant issues are starting to arise is just around strategic capacity. Understandably, councils are focusing on preserving frontline services and looking at, at uh, corporate head office and backroom functions, and that has meant a thinning out of senior management and uh, um, strategic management within organisations, and it is reducing the ability to plan uh, and spreading the, the focus, if you like, of many of the senior officers. Okay, but in terms of, I, mean, I think, and I apologise if I didn't mention that, that's helpful, that that that, that ties in with the evidence we've heard elsewhere and was going other parts of the local authority budget, but we're specifically asking about the affordable housing, uh, the AHIP budget in the last financial year right. and going forward. Um, just to get balance, I can assure there'll be lots of opportunity to put on record what the challenges are to local oh, authorities. We have to get a balance at committee in relation to the affordable housing budget, Mr. Keane. Mm -hmm. is, is that is, is that an, at an appropriate level? The trend in that budget, how do you feel that's going? I mean, yeah, the, the the affordable housing program has grown substantially in the last couple of years. It's sufficient, broadly speaking, within the current grant regime to meet the target, uh, and the focus is on meeting that target. So, no, I don't. We, no, I don't think you're going to hear evidence that says there isn't enough money in the affordable housing program to deliver the commitment to 50,000 affordable houses or the, or the social housing program. I think okay. we're confident that the resources are there. And that's it. I might just miss it later in a second, but you did. The, the first part of your answer was was important because if if you feel there's challenges in terms of the amount of senior officers you have within within local authorities to help direct and shape some of that budget in terms of working partnership with the housing association movement. That is an appropriate thing to put on the record. So you seem to be saying the budget is is is, is of a good quality in terms of getting back in the business of building significantly more 
uh, social rented and affordable homes. But if there are challenges in relation to having the senior officials to direct that at a local level, that would be an appropriate thing to put on the record, Mr Cain. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, £3 billion over five years is a huge commitment. It's a huge commitment that the Scottish Government has made and a very welcome one. And the sector is, is working hard to deliver on the, the target of 50000 I don't think <coughs> other than a continuing conversation around differential grant rates between local authorities uh, and housing associations, I don't think anybody's expressing any substantial concern about the amount of money being committed by the Scottish Government to the affordable housing programme at this point. And you've made your previous points, yeah, yeah, which, which is, which is generally that. helpful, it's just to get a balance to the evidence. Uh, Mr Stewart? Uh, yeah, really just to, to say that um, the 50,000 homes target and the three billion commitment are, are very, very welcome. I mean, I, I think... Um, the target was based on, on solid evidence, including a report by SFHA, Shelter and CIH on, on the outstanding need for affordable housing in Scotland. But um, no, the, it's very positive that the, the levels of uh, subsidy went out up after the 2015 subsidy review working group. Um, it's very good that there's a three-year resource planning assumptions, which I think... Um, allows local authorities and housing associations to plan longer term and commit to the programme. So it, 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 it's good, good news. I mean, there are some challenges in terms of ramping up to actually meet that commitment, but no, the, the, the level of funding is very welcome. Is, are, are we in a situation where actually other parts of well, the wider local authority budgets, would, would they not uh, bite your hand off for certainty? over multi-year funding, which appears to be what uh, local authorities and the Housing Association movement having going forward. So uh, is that helpful in, in, in planning ahead in relation to affordable housing programmes? Yeah, I, I would certainly yeah, say so. Absolutely. Yeah. Although worth noting that the answer to that question is yes, but it is worth noting that we have three years' worth of resource planning assumptions and, we've, and councils have just submitted a five-year ship. So we're back into a place now where the last two years of submitted programmes are speculative in terms of the resources available. We only have three, uh, but we're already planning for years four, years five, and year six, but we don't know what those resources will be. So one of the points we made in our submission is actually we need to move to a much longer time frame for planning uh, new affordable housing or planning housing supply, uh, but you know, it would be churlish beyond belief to complain about the position we're in in terms of resources committed to the programme. Okay, that, that's, that, that's helpful. Now, we asked our committee clerk and team to kind of pick through evidence, pick out things where we, we give a bit of additional scrutiny to. And we did pick up that Alacho's submission said there was a number of aspects to the housing programme that needed to be addressed. And at point 2.7 of that submission, uh, it is said there is no clarity about what overall objective intervention in the housing market is intended to achieve or what a, property, a, pro a properly effective housing system would look like. Would be helpful if you were able to elaborate on that a little bit. And, uh, we, we work with a, with a numbers target. The target is 50,000. What's, what's the connection between a, an additional 50,000 affordable houses or an additional 35,000 uh, social rented housing uh, and our expectations around homelessness, our expectations around housing need more generally? What impact do we think that would have on waiting lists? What would be the economic impact of that beyond simple jobs in the construction sector? How will that bear on... Um, Poverty, fuel poverty, child poverty, uh, and other aspects of that agenda. None of these things are worked through in a full rationale for the affordable housing programme. We work, if you'll forgive me, on the assumption that more houses are good, um, but we don't get much beneath that in terms of what we really expect the impact of that scale of expenditure to be. And if I mean, the other reason we make this point is that this year, very welcomely, but for the first year in 30, we will arrive at the 31st of March 2018 with more social rented houses than we had at the 1st of April uh, 2017. Mm -hmm. We haven't actually done that since 1981. Okay. Once you start to grow a sector, you have to ask the question, how many is too many? And we've never had to ask ourselves that question for 30 years either. So we're probably moving into a phase where a more sophisticated conversation about the purpose of investment uh, in affordable housing is needed. Uh, that I accept all of that, but I'm a little bit confused, and that's easily done, Mr Keane, I, I can assure you, but my understanding is that each year 
the local authorities would do a housing needs assessment, which would then feed into a, strate a strategic housing investment programme. So when you say you're not quite sure what that would look like, is it not the job of local authorities to decide what that would look like? I and you've now been given significant increased monies to deliver what that would look like. So can I ask you then, given that my understanding is that's the process that local authorities are supposed to be delivering on in partnership with the Housing Association movement, what would a properly effective housing system look like um, and why do you think housing needs assessments and ships or strategic housing investment programmes are not delivering on that? Are, are they delivering on the relatively narrow purpose of planning an investment programme and an investment programme which is driven by, by numbers? What they're not delivering on is what so what is the definition of a properly functioning housing system in scotland and how does that differ between glasgow and edinburgh mm -hmm. maury aberdeen inverness and and the western isles i don't know that at a national level we have a clear understanding of, of what we're trying to achieve i will ask the minister that that very question when he appears at committee i, I get the fact that the, the ship program is numbers driven because you know the envelope you know the money is available you know the thirty-five thousand minimum affordable uh, social rented housing up to 50,000 when you add in a mix of other affordable housing. But the housing needs assessment at a local level isn't numbers driven, that's a housing needs assessment. So do local authorities know what that would look like? Because you can't have a uniform national programme by definition, Mr Keane, when you make the point that each local authority area has got very, very different dynamics. That's why it's localised to local authorities with housing needs assessment to feed into ships, which I fully accept are numbers driven. So. What do you think local authorities should be doing more to have a proper effective housing system from your point of view? I, I wouldn't put this at the, at the door entirely of local authorities. I think a national conversation about what a properly functioning housing system looks like. What is an appropriate balance across the tenures, for example? Do we think that uh, the private rented sector is fully affordable across the whole of Scotland? Are we content with what is being built uh, by the speculative uh, construction sector in terms of size and numbers and distribution uh, and types? Are we happy that the right number of houses are being built that need to meet the needs of people of older people or people with disabilities. Now, these, these are all questions that, that aren't clearly answered either locally or nationally. What we do locally is deliver a program within the financial envelope that we have based on the opportunities that are there. What we're not necessarily saying is we think we should have X percentage of the stock locally in social renting, X percentage in private renting, uh, X percentage in, in owner occupation. We don't have that conversation. And as a consequence, we live in a world where in East Renfrewshire, 12% of the stock is in social renting, and in West Dumbarton, 37% of the stock is in social renting. Which of those is right or nearest right? Well, again, I'm just adding to my confusion here, because I actually thought it was the job of local authorities and not national government to do their housing needs assessments and then to feed into a SHIPS programme, which is numbers and revenue driven, a fully capital expenditure driven, I fully accept that, and then for the housing minister to make sure that the transition between your housing needs assessment, i.e. how many large family homes do we need, how many disabled homes need, do we need, how, what mix of tenures do we need, those are things that I thought were fleshed out within a housing needs assessment at a local authority basis. So maybe what our committee has to understand about what housing needs assessments do or don't do at a local authority level as part of that wider national housing strategy. And, and, and some of that effort is made, but I don't think you'll find a housing needs assessment anywhere in Scotland that says the private rented sector should double in size in the next 10 years, or uh, new house building should decline by 45% in the next 10 years, um, So, or that the cost of housing of a particular type should rise at the rate that it does. These are not, generally speaking, part of that calculation. It's, it's an overview of how the system works. If, if we accept, and many folk do, that the housing system isn't functioning fully effectively, uh, and other people have said stronger things about it than that, uh, if we accept it's not f working fully, fully effectively, then we need to start with the question, what does the Scottish housing system look like that does function fully effectively? I don't think you answer that at a local authority level. I think that needs to be discussed and worked through at a national level. I'm not suggesting that it's solely the Scottish Government's responsibility to answer that question. I'm saying we need a more sophisticated conversation about what we're trying to achieve in housing terms. And I promise we'll ask all these questions to, to, to the Scottish Government. I, I suppose I didn't expect to get involved in this interaction, oh, but it's oh. genuinely quite <laughs> helpful. Uh, do you think we have to have an improved housing needs assessment at local level to start to tease out some of these things as part of that, tying together what a national strategy looks like? I, I don't think the housing needs assessment is the weakness.
it's, it's as sophisticated now as it has ever been. Uh, when I started working in housing planning, we worked on prevalence rates. There are so many of these types of situations in the population as a whole, so we need X many houses to meet it. Uh, fairly crude, but it was as good as we have. What we have now is, is more sophisticated and, and fit for purpose in exactly the same way. But right. what but we're not answering is a big strategic question. When is enough enough? When, when do we have enough social rented houses? We're going to build 35,000. How many do we need in the next five years? Right. I, I'm, not, I'm still not sure what stopping local authorities making those... We those, didn't, those, we, local those, authorities those, didn't set the target. So, no, hang on, hang on. You, I, I think <laughs> we're, we're missing the point here. It's for local authorities, irrespective of the national target, to decide what their housing needs assessments are. They're democratically empowered to do that to deliver on, on housing in their areas. I think we would all agree that. We all appreciate that that feeds into a, a ship system, which is numbers and capital driven, depending on funding from central government. So what I've been trying to tease out, and I'm just going to leave this sitting, let my colleagues in who have got supplementaries on this particular matter. Uh, I would have thought if local authorities had a view in the mix between public and private sector housing, or buy to rent, or sublet properties, or new build properties within their local area, they're, they're big enough and capable enough to take a view on that without waiting for national government. I thought that's what housing needs assessments did. If they don't, maybe they should do. That's the point I'm making. Do you think they should do? I, it, it, housing needs assessments are part of a framework which is there to do particular things. I suspect if you look at the outcomes of the housing needs assessments across the 32 councils, you will see conclusions being drawn about the need for affordable housing, which are substantially in excess of either the local land supply or the SHIP programme. And there's a translation of housing needs assessment into uh, land supply, which is done through the planning system, which invariably means a substantial reduction from the total number of assessed houses required. I get all that, but I don't think that was an answer to my question. Do you think housing needs assessment should be making localised decisions on what the tenure mix looks like and that profile looks like? Yeah, I think that should be like part of the local housing and planning it's system. it's not yes. at the moment? No. Right, okay. That, that, that's, that's all I wanted to establish. That doesn't tell that. That makes, sense, that makes sense part of a national framework, but it's not nationally setting targets for local authority areas, and there's nothing to stop local authorities doing that just now. That's what I just have to check. Uh, uh, Eileen Smith, followed by Graham Simpson. So, thanks, Convener, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Mr Kane. it was something you said earlier in just pursuing this line of questioning. So, are local authorities doing a quality impact assessments on their strategic housing plans and on their, uh, their their plans and if they're not then how could they be taking steps to to look at emerging inequalities and addressing those I, I confess i haven't searched all 32 websites but it's a statutory requirement i would expect there to be equality uh, impact assessments against ships published along with the ships yes and if there was then um what steps do you think they'll be taking then to address the emerging inequalities that might come out of that? Uh, I, it would depend on, on the local environment, but what I expect them to do is identify particular equalities impacts and then focus on those. So one of them might be um, a gendered equalities impact and victims of or survivors of domestic violence and okay. so looking at how, how you would improve the provision for that particular group. Uh, you might look at young people, you will certainly look at older people and people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. But invariably, you're planning to deliver at a level which is below your measured need. The measured need for wheelchair housing and accessible housing is substantially in excess of, of what the programme will produce in the next three years. I think we, and we might be coming on to some of that later with you, but actually it was domestic abuse I was particularly interested in, and, and you mentioned it yourself. Yeah. So I just wondered whether, if you're aware that any progress has been recorded on the housing needs of that specific group. I, I, mean, I, I would struggle to quote, but what I know is that there is a live conversation in the housing sector, certainly in the, in the policy circles that I'm involved in, about the, ex the extent to which our response to domestic abuse is, is adequate, sufficient, and as sophisticated as it should be, uh, and whether or not we now need to move to a different approach to uh, a whole range of issues. So that conversation is starting. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Graham Simpson. Yeah, but just, uh, just really a, uh, a quick follow-up uh, for... Uh, again, for yourself, Mr. Kane. <laughs> um, Other witnesses are available. We'll get yeah, to yeah, you, I promise. Yeah. Um, you, you said earlier that uh, ships are not the problem. I think that's what you said. Yeah. Um, so what is the problem? Uh, the problem is we have a relatively narrow conversation about what we're trying to achieve in the world of housing. Uh, and for 30 years, that narrow conversation has been dominated by questions around tenure 
and the received wisdom has been that everybody really wants to own their own home and that would be best for everybody if they did, mm. putting, putting it crudely. I think we're now moving from a, to a more, slightly more sophisticated and nuanced uh, understanding of tenure, uh, but we haven't yet turned that into actually probably the current levels of uh, owner-occupation are unsustainable, the prices in owner-occupation are too high, uh, many people are left without a choice because of the absence of genuinely affordable alternatives in every community area. Social housing still exists in a relatively narrow range of, of locations, not in every location you might want to live in. Uh, and uh, we need to have a different conversation about how you balance that out. Okay. Uh, um, the convener uh, focuses questions on uh, count councils, really. Mm -hmm. Are you saying something needs to happen nationally? If so, what, what needs to happen? I, um, I didn't come here with the expectation of being asked to provide a prescription for a future housing planning uh, and delivery well, you, program. You've, you've raised it, Mr. <laughs> I certainly did. Um, I, what I think is we need to have a conversation about what it is, what we think a properly functioning housing system looks like. What ought to be the balance between uh, owner occupation, private renting, social renting, and other forms of affordable housing? Uh, how do we understand the choices that people are making and what the access routes are? Uh, and how do you reflect that uh, in the supply? I mean, I would t as the best example of a, of a relatively narrow provision might be around young single people. Yeah. We offer, it's a one size fits all in the world, account social rented housing. It's, yeah. it's a council house or a flat. Whether or not that meets the needs of, of young folk uh, more particularly, then, then we haven't yet got into that conversation. If you look at, in contrast, where we are with older people, we have a whole variety of different types, uh. including types of shared accommodation for older people which are useful in addressing things like loneliness for example and helping in the provision of support those problems exist for, for young single people too but we still insist on, on a relatively narrow offer and i think it's some of that conversation that we need to have yeah so that could be like young professionals just starting out can't can't afford to buy their own home if they want to um, that that sort of, that, sort of, that sort of person that that group but also the the, the group that i mean the the most clearly established route from home to independent living is through uh, yeah. education, university, student accommodation. Yeah. Uh, and for the privileged group that goes through that route, it's relatively clear and they get a chance to fail an experiment without too much difficulty. We don't have, if you're not going to university, if you're at college instead, mm. um, and you're not, you don't want to live at home or you can't live at home, we don't have an obvious route for that cohort of single people to think about and make choices in the housing options. Yeah. Convener, I know you want to move on to other subjects. Yes, yes. Uh, don't worry, we, we're, we are moving on from this, but we can certainly ask questions on this all day, I feel, uh, Mr Gibson. Yeah, thanks Steve. very much, Convener. I'm pleased to say that Tony Kane actually answered what I was going to ask as my first question. So I'm going to move on straight to Dave Stewart, and it's regarding his submission, uh, paragraph 3.11. You say, and I quote, there's also a question as to whether sufficient housing is being developed in rural and remote communities. Uh, recent research by the Rural Housing Scotland found that rural Scotland was not getting its fair share of affordable housing investment and that the problem was particularly acute in remote areas, although particular funds have been set up for rural island communities to help address this. Uh, I am asking this question because I actually have two islands, Cumbria and Arran, uh, in my constituency, as well as a rural hinterland in North Ayrshire. So I'm just wondering uh, how useful uh, has the Rural and Islands uh, Housing Fund proved to date? I believe um, that the the fund has proved very very useful, uh, and that was acknowledged. Um, I was at a recent uh, roundtable event, looking at the question of whether there was enough um, funding going to rural communities and whether they were getting their fair share. And um, while, as I say, there, there's this research that suggested um, maybe there's there's not a fair share and there, there's not enough of the funding for the 50,000 homes going to rural and remote communities. It, it was acknowledged that the Rural and Island uh, Fund has been helpful. Okay, and are there other ways apart from that fund that we could uh, encourage investment in rural housing? I, I think then it's maybe a, a matter for a, a conversation about um, the, the research that, that I saw suggested that over the last maybe five years, there's been less investment going into rural areas. So perhaps it's a, a conversation that could be had um, with COSLA, the Scottish Government, and, and with housing associations just to, to tease that out and see whether there needs to be a, a, a change in, in where investment goes. I mean, the 50,000 homes, as I've said, the target and the three billion are, are very, very positive, but I suppose then there'll be a question within that of 
can we make sure that either enough of the money goes to housing for older people or people with particular needs? And can we make sure enough of it goes to uh, rural communities? And I suppose um, looking at the ships uh, as they come in uh, and then building on those as they're delivered each year might be an opportunity to, to just make sure a, you know, a fair share of investment goes to these different areas. Mr. Keane, you're keen to come in? Yes, sorry. Uh, one of the issues that was raised uh, at that session was the difficulty about the way in which the housing planning system works. In order to qualify for investment from the affordable housing program, you have to demonstrate housing need. If your objective is to promote uh, population growth, community growth, and economic activity, you might struggle to demonstrate that there is anybody actually needing that house at that moment in our most remote and more remote rural communities. So you will struggle to secure investment through the affordable housing program if your ambition is to grow your community and grow economic activity. And I, I mean, I pick it out in the, in the submission I made about the Scottish Government's um, commitment to repopulating and empowering Scotland's rural coastal and island communities. If you stick with, demonstrate that there is a need from the existing population before we'll give you invest in new housing, then the people of, now forgive me, Alva are six residents on an island that previously had 600 keen to grow the population, but they wouldn't qualify for an investment for affordable housing through the affordable housing program because they wouldn't be able to demonstrate any need on that island. There are only six people living there. So it's how do you square that it gets back to some of the earlier conversation as well. I think there is a need to look again at how you're connecting the affordable housing investment program with some of our wider policy objectives around remote rural communities in particular. And the figure that the research suggested was that 18% of the Scottish population lives in these areas, about 6% of the affordable housing program output is going to these areas. So there is some evidence that our remote rural communities are losing out at the moment. Yeah, can I just follow that up just a bit briefly, convener? All the means Wolf Island, incidentally. Uh, I don't know when the last Wolf actually lived on the island. But um, I, and, and Arne and my constituency, that uh, when I was elected in 2007, it had the highest uh, per capita homelessness problem in all of Scotland. It's been 96 houses built since then. But is, it, is the cost of building houses in, in remote areas uh, a, draw, a, a real disincentive for, for local authorities? Because if one thinks about it, to build on an island can cost 50%, perhaps even double what it might cost on the mainland, because you have to, have to often import not just materials, but workers, and they have to be housed, uh, 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 fed, etc. Is, it, is there some way in which that can be rebalanced, do you think, to ensure that there's no disincentive for local authorities who are split between mainland and island, or Gael, obviously, Highland, uh, North Ayrshire? In, in the delivery of housing investment programmes is the art of the practical. It's not a science. And you deliver where you can as mm -hmm. much as where you want to. And mm -hmm. that's the reality of it, where the land is, where communities are supportive, um, where, where you can uh, secure the opportunities. And that does mean that more difficult locations will tend to get put to the back of the queue. I think it would be unrealistic to think anything else. I don't think that means there aren't significant efforts being made to invest in remote rural communities where a need is demonstrated. Yeah. I think it means that where some other objective is being served, they're less likely to spend some time actually looking at that. And I, 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 my understanding is that some of these conversations have gone around, for example, in the community ownership uh, groups that have taken over uh, control of, of, of the land around them, finding it more difficult to engage with the affordable housing program and, and deliver. And I think there's a conversation about how you match those two objectives. And just lastly, in terms of acquiring land in rural areas, are there, are there any greater difficulties, do you feel, in rural and island areas? Because sometimes local authorities tend to look at um, island communities as perhaps uh, 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 differently from mainland with things like village envelopes, for example, where you can't build outside unless it's specifically for you know, agricultural use, and that, that has, uh, can really inhibit uh, growth in, in, in some of the rural and island communities. I think the challenges are likely to be different. They're not likely to be substantially, substantially more. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think issues around settlement patterns, which are very mm -hmm. different in the more remote rural areas, we have these dispersed settlement patterns against the more compact villages that you see. But I think also the planning process and people's expectations as I, one of the comments I made at the round table event, in 1692 the population of Glencoe was over 500. That's the number counted at the point at which the Glencoe massacre took place. It's about 350. How do we imagine the landowner in Glencoe and the planning authority would react if we said we'd like to build another 50 or 100 houses to bring this population back up to where it was 300 years ago? I, I think it wouldn't be a positive conversation. Mm. And that's about thinking about what do we mean by 
repopulating our rural and island communities and what does that mean for the way we direct our housing investment? Yeah, it was historic population that peaked at 15,000 two centuries ago, now it's now 3,500, yeah, so I understand right. that yeah. point. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, in a moment, we're moving on to Andy Whiteman. I just want to mop up a question. Again, I apologise for Mr Kane, but it's, 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 it's of relevance to you and it's to give you the opportunity to put something on the record. Um, there's a lower subsidy benchmark for councils in relation to uh, subsidy grants to build new build properties. Um, compared to re regular social landlords, as a general rule, there is, as we know, there's no hard and fast specific grant, and there are flexibilities and local discretions. But why might there be a, an issue for councils, or why do you think there's a lower subsidy benchmark? Uh, well, it, it's historical uh, from the current round of uh, discussions we've had around benchmarks. I, looking back at the papers, and I was involved in the first subsidy review group that agreed subsidy levels at, with including differentials. And I don't think there was any clear uh, rationale for it at that time beyond, from, but from a local authority point of view, bear in mind that up until that point, we hadn't been eligible for subsidy at all. We were just very happy to be getting back into the process of building houses and yeah. we were going to get some money. I, I said last year that we weren't making, Alacho is not making a big issue of this sure. through this round of investment. I'm aware that a number of local authorities have their own concerns and have expressed them. The question we asked last year is why is it fair that council tenants pay a higher proportion of the cost of each new affordable house than um, housing association tenants, but we think that's a matter for the uh, conversation when the general issue of grant rates is reopened, as it will need to be uh, in the run-up to, to the next programme. Okay, and just briefly, Mr Shirt might want to come in on that, but it, it, it's often said, doesn't make it true, but it's often said one of the reasons, that might not explain the full differential between local authorities and the housing association movement is quite often... Uh, Housing, housing association are having to purchase land whereas local authorities may have the land in existence or backroom staff to deal with a lot of the technical aspects of house building whereas housing associations have to contract and purchase in a lot of that expertise. I'm not saying that explains the differentials but I'm just wondering if Mr Stewart would like to comment on any of that. I, I certainly think it's the case that um, associations ha generally have to buy land and, and access to land and the cost of land uh, probably is one of the bigger challenges around um, delivering the, the 50,000 homes uh, program so uh, th that certainly <coughs> arguably would be a reason for the benchmarks but I, I can't really comment on the cost that it was giving both the opportunity to put yeah. something on the record if you wish. That, 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 that was all. Insofar as you know, I mean, the other point about the benchmarks is the biggest differential is between councils developing remote rural areas and housing associations developing remote rural areas. And that's the biggest differential within those grants. And that's probably the one area where just now we would say, well, it's that's it's quite harsh. Uh, and I have to say, we have some concerns about grant levels in relation to particular needs housing. But w we haven't included it in our evidence here. Mm. We think where we are with that is. is, is is okay for now. We will want to have another conversation about it when the issue of grant levels more generally is reopened. And that, that's very helpful. We'll move on uh, to another section now. Mr Whiteman. Thanks very much, Convener. I just want to talk about the 50,000 uh, target. Uh, incidentally, I think in SFHA evidence, you talk about a government commitment to build 50,000 affordable homes. I think we have it on the record that it's about delivering. It won't all be built. Um, we had the, the Minister... Uh, give us evidence saying that in terms of the programme, uh, he made it very clear that if councils are unable to spend the resources they're given, he'd have no qualms about moving it. And the First Minister at her party conference said that if you don't use all your allocation to deliver new housing, we'll take back the balance and give it to one that can. If you don't use it, you will lose it. I'm just wondering if you can give us any reflections on what you think lies behind that, whether you think it's appropriate, what kind of timescales you think that might operate on, given that I... I, I assume that some councils and housing associations will find it easier to get up to speed and get building early because they've got plans in place, they've got land available, others won't. Is this a, um, a threat, if you like, or a, an intention that you see being um, implemented over the whole programme or very early on? Thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I was aware of those comments, and, and I suppose it could be that um, I, I think there's, it's always been the case that um, where a programme might be slightly underspent in one area, then if there's capacity, say, in Edinburgh and the Lothians or in the Highlands to spend more, then some of that money will 
will be shifted to, to make sure that it's spent and, and maybe the overall targets for building affordable homes is met. But having said that, you know, I, I think that's maybe reasonable if you're not talking about huge sums of money or, or numbers. Um, I, I think it's important, while the 50,000 homes is a great opportunity, it's obviously important that homes are then built where there's identified areas of need rather than just simply where it's easiest to build them. And, and, and I suppose that goes back a little to the comments I made about making sure there's enough homes for older people or people with particular needs or maybe needing to look to see if enough homes are being built in rural and, and remote areas. Yeah. I, it's, I, I confess I was slightly baffled when, when I heard those comments uh, from the First Minister, if only because it's always been the case that if one local authority underspends on its affordable housing programme, at, at some point during the year, it would there would be a conversation about whether we needed to get shifted to another authority uh, that was capable of uh, of spending it. So it's not a change in position. It's not new. It, to the extent that the statement focuses the minds of everybody in in uh, uh, housing delivery and councils that they need to get on and, and deliver, then then perhaps it's helpful. But it's not new. So it's not changed the rules around in, within which we work. Okay. So you see it as a sort of a political statement. Get moving. I'd, rather I'd, than anything I'd, substantially I'd, changing. I'm, I'm not about to try and understand the First Minister's motivation in making the statement. What I'm saying is it wasn't telling us anything that we didn't know. Um, okay. And if we were going to take anything from it, it probably should be that you need to get on and, 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 and deliver. But yeah. what it maybe reflects is that the annual nature of the budget, and perhaps that's the thing that's unhelpful, and, uh, and being clearer about uh, uh, some of the longer-term issues might help us with that. But, uh, but I'd, nobody reacted, nobody, nobody that I spoke to, the local authority sector, reacted with, to that statement in anything other than yeah, so that's how it works. It always has done. Uh, we'll, we'll Step, Mr. Keane. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bateman, do you want to follow up? Okay, that's, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's very helpful. I mean, what are the sort of key problems or difficulties that councils and housing associations are finding in delivering uh, new, new uh, affordable uh, homes? I, I just note from the completions under the Affordable Homes Programme uh, to the year uh, 1st of April 2016 to June 2017 that just two-thirds were actually new builds. So over a third are actually existing homes that are being acquired or, or refurbished. What are the kind of problems that, or issues that are being faced that we possibly need to be aware of? I would say that when we speak to members about delivering new homes, the, the main issues are probably about the availability of land and, and the cost of it, uh, then whether infrastructure is actually in place to, to allow them to to build on the land, um, and there's also a, a bit of an issue, I would say, just w with human resources, that whether that's housing associations have the development staff to, to build new homes, whether that's local authorities, and going back to one of Tony's earlier comments, having the, the management staff in place to support programmes, or actually it could be about planning departments, uh, building control officers, or even just about uh, skilled workers being able to build homes. Um, and I think that that goes back to the fact that the 50,000 programmes, a big increase in target, but comes on the back of when there had been cuts and a substantial slowdown in, in building. So it's then a bit of a challenge, and actually it would take time for people to, to get back up to speed to, to increase delivery, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just to say, well, actually, it's always taken the view that acquisition of houses on the second-hand market or um, completed units by developers that are unsold is, is appropriate and should form a, a significant part of the programme. It's a sensible way of going about our business. It allows a great deal of flexibility apart from anything else. But I don't think the challenges in delivering are any different now than they were five years ago. The scale is obviously an issue, and there's been some loss of resources during the period when the programme was, was, was wound down. Land can be challenging planning environment, community uh, relations can be challenging, consultation. Um, particularly, I mean, this may be an issue that we face in the, in the local authority sector, more so than our colleagues in the housing associations, but it's not unusual for communities to be concerned about council housing uh, being built in their area where there hasn't previously been any council housing. And I've had those conversations with any number of communities in rural and urban areas. Uh, and th that takes time uh, and, it, and it adds to the length of the process. But these are not new challenges. The land issue is not a new, new, a, a new issue in that sense. It's, it's okay. building the skill set up has been. So. 
Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Whiteman. Can we move on to Graham Simpson? Thanks. Uh, I've got a specific line of questioning, but I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to follow up on the, the land issue because um, SFHA uh, mentioned this in your written submission, um, where you said that city deals um, should give greater priority to unlocking land and be more transparent. That's something the committee's been looking at. Um, so I wonder if you could uh, expand on that. No, no, actually, that could you, you could all probably chip in on this if, if you want. Yeah, it was really just that um, we see city deals as a, a great opportunity. Obviously, they're um, providing funding that could be used to provide infrastructure to, to unlock land. Um, actually, having uh, written the, the submission, I noticed that you had evidence from the site of Edinburgh Council where they're prioritising social housing and, and putting quite a lot of the focus of their city deal on to providing new social housing, which, mm. which is good. Um, but the comment was just really that, um, given that they're a, an opportunity to really look at in, investing in infrastructure and, and boosting local economies, um, we felt that there maybe could be more emphasis generally given in some of the city deals to, to housing and, and to look into to unlock sites. Any, anyone else? Mr. Mr. Kane, I think you're based in North Lanarkshire, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm, no I'm, I'm based in Stirling, but Stirling. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'd, uh the, uh, we have a one of our objectives is is to better understand and engage with the Scottish Cities Alliance and, and, and the City Deal, and that's been a very positive conversation for us. I think it's it's for the Cities Alliance and themselves to work through the extent to which they think housing is a priority for them. But City Deal doesn't include how the Westminster version of City Deal doesn't have a housing element to it because it's a a, a devolved function. So it would always be within City Deal a bit of shoehorning. But I think Edinburgh is a really good example of the way in which you, you manage that and the strong commitment that Edinburgh City Council has made to, to affordable housing within its city growth plan, I think is very, very positive. Okay. Unison? Yeah. Mr. Ferguson, I promise you I forgotten about you, of course, <laughs> get my eye to, to come in at any point. There's a whole host of questions for you. You well, have okay. to take my word for that. But Mr. Ferguson. I just want to make reference to the Glasgow Regional City deal because I think that my view of, I mean, there's been, there's political priorities have been around infrastructure and transport. In, in that deal, and whilst we welcome obviously new money coming into local government because that's a, a new thing in itself, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, investment. But I think I would have liked to have seen more community based projects uh, be incorporated into that, such as social housing. Uh, and I think that we would have welcomed that. And I think it would have helped to mitigate some of the the, the issues that we're facing in the local government uh, if there was a flexibility. I don't know if there is a flexibility to do it within it, but if there, there is, then I would, have, I would have preferred to have seen that. Uh, more community-based projects rather than the big infrastructure. Whilst I accept the infrastructure projects will boost the local economy, I'm not going to counter that argument. But what I think, I think that if you can, uh, if there was more that that money can be used to invest in our communities, I think we'd have been overall but better off in, in our communities for that. Okay, that's useful. Um, but it's not really what we're here to question you on today. But, um, but it is a, an area we've been looking at. So if I, if I can ask about the uh, adaptations budget now, um, and again, anyone can, can answer this, but Mr. Kane, um, you mentioned that in your uh, written evidence. Uh, you, you were actually critical uh, of the lack of leadership over the adaptations budget, and you said that the Scottish Government hasn't increased it for five years. You say, as a result, demand has outstripped supply, um, so I wonder if you can give any examples of where problems uh, have occurred. Uh, you also say, uh, and this is something that uh, Mr Stewart might want to comment on, that uh, RSL tenants are getting a less effective service with some waiting uh, for months. So uh, again for Mr Kane first, can you <coughs> provide uh, evidence for that? Yeah, I, I think some housing association tenants is what I said and, and, and I stand by that. It, it, it's patchy in a way that it shouldn't be. There are, there are three funding streams for, three principal funding streams for adaptations in, in the, the social, in across housing, two of which rest with local government. So one is money from the housing revenue account, the other is uh, general fund money to support adaptations in the private sector. And there is a third stream of money which is held by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government took a decision that those pots held by local authorities should be transferred to IJBs. Scottish Government money is held by the Scottish Government. Uh, 
the report, and I quote it in my, in my uh, um, submission, said very clearly, the 2012 Adapting for Change report said very clearly that leadership on, on uh, adaptations should rest very clearly with the Strategic Housing Authority. Uh, the Minister took a decision to transfer local authority funding and therefore an element of leadership to IJBs. I think that leaves us with inconsistency in the way in which uh, funds are being directed and managed and a lack of clarity about leadership, but also a lack of clarity about the Scottish Government's purpose in this. The Scottish Government has committed to implementing fully the recommendations of the 2012 Adapting for Change report, but it has already undermined the principle, uh, the, the leading recommendation about leadership by transferring responsibility to the IJBs. I'm not objecting to it being transferred to the IJBs. What I'm saying is that we haven't moved on in five years in improving the way in which we deliver adaptations, and this is now pretty much the only area of housing association performance where local authorities consistently perform better. I'm not saying local authorities are as good as they should be either, but and in terms of evidence of that, I, I haven't mined the uh, um, ARC reports to come up with horror stories, but I do know of one association which recently changed management, new management came in and identified a 500 day plus average wait for an adaptation, a year and a half average wait uh, in one housing association. That is now fixed, but it wasn't unusual, and you wouldn't find that in the local authority sector. So, um, we've had a, a long conversation about adaptations. It hasn't moved substantially in the last three or four years. The Scottish Government have made commitments about this, and we have struggled to move them on. I'm aware that some of those conversations are now opening up, um, and that the officials are now talking to uh, others, uh, particularly around the, uh, um, uh, the improvement service uh, on adaptations uh, and the IHUB. But we haven't made progress, and the budget hasn't. I think it's longer than five years. I think it might be eight years since the Scottish Government's budget was raised. It's certainly five years. And forgive me, can you think of any other area of activity where demand has stayed so constant that you could have left the budget stable uh, with an ageing population for five years and it not had an impact on outcomes? It has to have had an impact. Yeah. Mr Stewart? Yeah, adaptations has come up as... Um, an issue that, that's uh, of concern for some of our members. Um, the way funding for it works is for the more expensive ones, associations receive a, a grant annually to fund them, and that does sometimes lead to there not being enough funding to, to carry out all of the adaptations that, that might be required. Um, so it is a challenge we're aware of. Um, one of my colleagues has had some discussions with the Scottish Government about um, the funding of adaptations and the possibility of moving to a more tenure neutral approach. So it, it is something that's being looked at, but as Tony said, um, the, the global amount of funding hasn't gone out, up over the last few years. And given that, um, you know, it's good for people to remain in their own home, and given that um, the population is ageing, I, I think that's maybe something that, that needs to be looked at. So Ms. Mr. Kane said in his written evidence that uh, some RSL tenants are waiting months you know, ra rather than weeks for adaptations. Is that purely down to funding? I believe it is, at least from the ones that have had uh, speak to me. We had a workshop at a conference earlier this year looking at adaptations, and there were some associations where you know they might spend their, their grant in the first few months of the year, and then there'd be a a wait before they could uh, get grant to fund further adaptations. And it seems to be something that that varies from different different areas as to the level of priority that, that's given to it. Okay. Elaine Smith, yeah. Thanks, convener. Yeah, I suppose it's on the issue more rather than adaptations <coughs> on new build housing for groups that actually would, would suit them better. And on that issue, um, the equality statement accompanying last year's budget, the Scottish Government specifically indicated they expected the housing investment to benefit a range of key groups, and that included disabled people and lone parents. So on that, um, I note, Mr Stewart, that on page 13 of your submission, paragraph 310, you mentioned the fact the Housing Subsidy Review Group um, had a number of recommendations that were accepted, but one that was not accepted was ring fence funding to support the supply of new build housing for older people and people with particular needs, presumably loan parents, etc. Can you expand a bit further on that? Why do you think that wasn't accepted? I think the decision that was taken at the time by the, 
the minister was that rather than having a ring-fenced fund, which would recognise that building that sort of housing was more expensive, that there would be flexibility given when associations or, or local authorities were applying for funding. And I suppose my view on that would be it's something that maybe needs to be constantly reviewed and monitored to see whether there, there's enough homes coming through in the ships and then actually being delivered. Um, SFHA and Shelter have uh, funded some research looking at um, what's proposed in the strategic housing investment plans uh, being delivered across Scotland. And the idea of that was partly to look at progress towards the 50,000 homes, but also to <coughs> explore specific provision, whether it's um, in rural areas or whether it's for particular needs. So I, I would just say I think it's something that we need maybe to monitor to see if there's a, enough being built as, as part of the programme. Well, it was the Housing Subsidy Review but Group convened by the Scottish Government that recommended it. So do you have a view on whether or not that recommendation should have been um, taken on board? Yeah, I, I think we felt at the time that, that it, it should have oh, been. Can yeah. I ask Mr Kane that same question then? What do you... I, I, th I think it was a recommendation of the group and it would have been clearly, I mean I wasn't involved at that time, the group clearly felt it was important and this was, was is a way of, of protecting that investment. I think it would have helped to focus minds whether or not it's the entire solution is another matter. I think housing, highly adapted housing for people with, with, with very significant uh, needs is usually built on a bespoke basis so you will include that type of house in a development where you know there's someone that needs it because building on a, on a speculative basis is is a bit of a risk I mean, you're talking about quite substantial additional amounts of cash and then the difficulty of having a property left empty if there isn't a client with the, with the level of particular needs required to, to occupy it um, but in general terms I think this the evidence is that the supply of housing adapted for people with disabilities uh, isn't sufficient and that many people with disabilities are living in houses that, that don't meet their needs. And th th there's plenty of evidence, I think, to support that statement. So it would probably have helped to focus the programme. And I wonder if you could give us, you might not be able to, but could you give any information, given that it was in the quality statement company in the budget last year about the, the loan parent issue, is, has there been any progress with regard to increase in social rented housing provision for loan parents? Do you know this or...? Is that not something you can comment on? I, I, the, the way that w I, I, I don't think there will. There has, I'm not aware of any specific change in the way in which allocations okay. policies generally work in relation to loan parents. Councils and housing associations allocate on a needs basis, um, so a loan parent with a housing need it will be a priority. But and very, very often that group is housed through the homelessness route, uh, as often as, as, as other ways anyway. So I'd, I'd, I think you'd struggle to find evidence of a change in practice and allocations to target accommodation at lone parents. OK, thanks. And maybe something in terms of the um, last year's equality statement and this housing review, housing subsidy review, it's maybe something the committee might want to look into a little bit further with the minister, I think. Absolutely. We're not reading the road of allocations policies, but we're here for the rest of the week, I think, if we were to, to do that. Final question on adaptions. I've got one final set of questions. Mr Stewart's going to take us, take us home on in relation to housing. Then I've got a suite of questions in relation to the unison written, 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 written evidence. Um, just a very small supplementary in relation to the adaptions. I, I think Mr Kane mentioned integrated joint boards and hoping that would drive change in relation to how adaptions were managed within, within the housing sector. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any evidence of um, some of that, because a lot of meaty money in the system transfer from healthcare to social care in relation to integration funds. I know half of that was to meet social care pay commitments, but, but I wonder if some of that would be identifying, be it a registered social landlord or a local authority, identifying that getting an adaption on quickly and speedily could get a person out of hospital two, three, four weeks earlier than otherwise would have to be in hospital and accessing those IGB funds above the £10 million adaptions budget that exists for RSLs, because that was kind of the point of having the integration, was the more clever and cute use of those monies to better meet the needs of those needing those adaptions and actually save money in the long term as well. Is there any evidence of any of that starting to happen? The, the 
pilot projects, the pilot projects that were run around um, adapting for change, I think have produced some quite strong evidence about the way in which the adaptations process needs to change and what better looks like. So we have some tests of change there, which which are very, which will be very useful when it comes to driving improvement. But I'm, we did a survey of our members last year. Nobody came back and said that the IJB was committing its own resources to support the adaptation adaptations process. So I'm not aware of IJBs putting money into. Um, adapted kitchens and bathrooms uh, in in the housing sector or or other uh, equipment is funded differently and I'm not in any sense able to talk about that but adap physical adaptations to houses no I'm not aware of IJBs directing their own resources to that and we can raise that with the minister Mr Stewart yeah. I don't know if there's anything you want to, to add to that or no, not I, I'm not aware of funding going in in that way but I, I agree that it would make a lot of sense to commit money to then save the, the health board money in hospital beds and, and to have better outcomes for, for individuals. And, I mean, there's probably a particular conversation required about adaptation to the private rented sector as well, which, which we haven't really touched on, but the, there are still some practical problems around uh, ensuring that private tenants where they need an adaptation can get that, particularly in shared accommodation. And there's been some work done on that, or shared, um, shared ownership situations. There's been some work done on that, but I don't know that we've, we've made the progress that we need to around that either. Yeah, I know from my own constituents the case where owner occupiers need to make something that's substantial investment to their properties that they can't quite afford, which could enable them to stay in those properties and just a more flexible approach to how that can be funded would, would, would certainly be beneficial from my constituents the case works. So I think that that's an important thing to to put on the record. I improvements to owners' homes always raises concerns about the use of public money. But opportunities to how equity stakes can be yes. taken in them or, yeah. or yeah. whatever, yeah. I, I, I suppose. Agree. Um, very helpful. Last set of questions on housing and then we'll move on to our other evidence. Mr Stewart. Thank you, Convener. In the submission, it makes reference to the, the funding of other housing-related services. So the pressures that we face in local authority, uh, for example, in homelessness uh, or in private landlord registration, uh, how can the 1819 budget address these pre pressures going forward? I, the answer is where the Scottish Government has specific ambitions for things to, for more to be done or things to be done differently, that it properly costs that activity and provides the resources. I, I make the point again in my submission that the landlord registration fee hasn't risen since the system was introduced in 2006. Um, that's quite a long time. Um, and there has to be a question about whether or not that fee remains appropriate. There is a, an ambition to, uh, for local authorities to be more effective in controlling the, the private rented sector that will cost money and we have the new legislation coming in now in force um, and lots of conversations about rent pressure zones taking place rent pressure zones will not be straightforward to achieve and there will be a cost in, in, in doing that so if the Scottish Government wants things to be done differently it seems to me not unreasonable to say you probably need to think about what that's going to cost and where the money is going to come from because if you don't provide it then it has to come from somebody else or it doesn't get done I don't feel obliged to come in on, on this, but any, any additional supplementary comments on that? Okay, do you want to follow? And, and the, the scope, therefore, uh, for improving the value for money uh, from the Homes Fund, and for example, uh, you know, commissioning, uh, the whole talk about procurement, uh, how, how well can local authorities and their partners achieve that? Uh, th there has been an enormous amount of work and uh, over the last... 10 years and more in improving public sector procurement and local authority procurement in particular. Uh, there are a number of framework contracts now available. You know, there's, so the, the, the landscape has changed quite dramatically around that, focused very largely on efficiency, effectiveness, on, on value for money and demonstrating value for money. So we are getting better at it. I suspect people aren't going to claim that we're as good as we uh, possibly can be, but we are getting better at that. And there is a strong focus on it, and that's supported uh, by the work the Scottish Government has done as well. Anything else, Mr. Stewart, in relation to that? That's fine, thank you. Can I just check on, on procurement? I'm, I'm, I'm dragging the depth of my memory here. The housing paper was Firm Foundations. Does that ring a nodding heads there? Yes, I, I remember it. Uh, back 2007, 2008, and one of the issues over procurement for small registered social landlords was about the bundling together of contracts. So two, three, four housing associations doing 20, 30, 40 unit developments rather than going out into the marketplace to procure... <coughs> You, you, could, you could contract the one architect for all three, four developments, it bundled together the contracts, drive efficiencies into the system, 
has I know firm foundations is now a thing of the past and things have moved on, but is that now kind of standard practice within the housing association movement? There's been quite a lot of work on improving procurement. Um, Scotland Excel have been funded by the Scottish Government to carry out procurement capability assessments to support associations and their practice. We ourselves have been able to employ a procurement advisor who gives advice, runs free training courses. And it is, um, when I've spoken to members about building the 50,000 homes, um, I, as I said earlier, there'd been a, a drop in the number of homes being built due to cuts in funding previously. What's happening quite often now is um, an association that may have expertise in development will actually do the new housing development for other associations. So, for example, Kingdom Housing Association and Fife do the development for what's called the Fife Alliance, a, a group of four associations. Um, Link Housing Association um, do development for a, a number of partner organisations. So we'd say that, that things have, have moved on since then and, and, and that is becoming increasingly common. Okay. Thank you. Now we're now going to move on. Before I pass the deputy, can you have to open up a new line in questioning? Just put on record, it'd be quite difficult to get panels of witnesses together where we've got two quite discrete themes we're trying to explore in evidence. So thank you to the patients of Mr Black and Mr Ferguson in relation to this, but it was the only way we could really get you in on the evidence sessions to put the panel together in this format. So, so thank you very much, Elaine Smith. Thanks, Convener Yen. Yeah, thank you very much for coming along. Obviously, your evidence is important to us because it's your members who are delivering on the ground the, the services that we're talking about and facing um, the, the cuts associated with reductions. And I know actually at the weekend that some of your evidence was picked up in the, the Herald last Saturday. Can I ask, first of all, then, if we look at your written evidence, uh, you basically talk about the, um, the budgets have been substantially cut and are far from adequate to meet the demand from citizens. So could you talk to us about the how you feel um, about the inadequacy of the the current um, settlements and also you specifically say last year's budget announcement in particular lacked clarity and it's hoped that this year there would be less spin. So to put that another way, could you perhaps talk to us about how you view the transparency of how the funding settlement is approached? Yeah. I, mean, I think what we mean by that is, I mean, that... Quite often, uh, in the last budget round, what was happening was the government was talking about ring fence monies and, and, and putting that out as, you know, there's additional money going into the local government. The, the announcements that were made and the funding that was made available, we didn't feel met the, the demands that were, that were required. And what we're saying there is that this wasn't a new investment. It was new investment with new priorities. So it wasn't investment coming into the local government to run the day-to-day, -day, you know, what comes from revenue, the day-to-day -day services that we need. So I think that's what we mean by spin, that we need to be we like something more clear coming across in the budget, that uh, it's around what funding is available for local government for the day-to-day -day services. Because what we have seen is that we're coming to an end of the salami slicing of, of, of the, 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 the services. And we're going to end up at a stage where local authorities, in our view, are going to be providing statutory functions only. And I think that will be a sorry day for Scotland and Scotland's communities if we end up at that stage. The salami slicing up to, to date has amounted to 30,000 job losses in the last 10 years in local government alone. And that is nine out of 10 jobs in the public sector that have gone. So what we are saying is that, yes, there, you know, that there has been additional pockets of money have been announced, uh, but they've been ring fence monies for specific purposes. Uh, therefore, it's not it's no available to be used in the general revenue. I don't think there's any doubt that revenue has gone down quite substantially uh, over the last decade. and. We, we feel with it, and our members are, are, are struggling to cope because the, there has been slamming slice of services, so we're still trying to provide a high level of service. We have very much reduced workforce, so I think that, that needs to be addressed and we need to see new revenue coming in. And I just want to say something about, you know, about the priorities, because there has been areas of the public services, within public services, that have been protected. Uh, low government's not one of them. Uh, and what the we view it is that we need to go back to basics about what people's basic needs are in our communities, and that is, you know, a home, a decent home, good education, you know, social care for our elderly, all the things that underpin good youth services. 
to help prevent the need for the other services that are being provided within the public service, the demand there, that if we get it right at the start, then we'll no need as much at the more higher end cost of the services later on. So I think what we're saying is that we would like a bit of honesty around the budget in terms of what's happening, and we're happy to have a conversation with the Scottish Government units on behalf of members about how we achieve that. But it needs to, we need to see increased investment. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that the committee ourselves last year did ask for more clarity on the way the, the figures were produced and what they <coughs> what they exactly meant. So we were also asking for that last year um, in terms of transparency. But we had we were at there was a briefing this morning actually a breakfast briefing on these issues, and some figures were were produced then. Um, and so on revenue, if I remember rightly. The figure that was mentioned was that the Scottish Government has seen a cut of 1.5% in revenue, but the cut to local government in revenue has been over 4%, 4.5%, I think, was mentioned. Do you have your do you have figures on that? When I mean, you're talking about looking at things in a different way, do, do you have your own figures on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And this is, this is, this is an, a, an issue and an argument that, uh, that we've used for... Uh, for quite for, for quite a long time now, and that and that is that local government has suffered um, differentially than other than other parts of the public sector. And if you look at uh, the fact that uh, local government is in this non-protected uh, uh, budget basis, as far as the government's concerned, um, we've seen cuts of between nine and fourteen percent. Uh, to local government, which can only impact uh, on the services uh, that uh, that are provided in local authorities, and it is the day-to-day -day services. Uh, it's the day-to-day -day services. It's the jobs of our members, and it's the pay of our members that are funded out of that revenue budget. So there has been a there has been a there has been a huge decrease uh, over the last eight, nine, ten years that has that has impacted quite severely and leaves us in the situation that we're in just now. And those figures that you mentioned, you yeah. do you have those figures available? Yeah, we've we, we, we produced we produced these figures. They they came from the Fraser 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 Wallander Institute uh, and they're contained within our submission to you to, to this committee. And um, again at the breakfast briefing we I suppose that part of the evidence we were hearing from the, the academics that, that, that were there was that um, in the end it might be services for, I think you've, you've mentioned that, Mr Ferguson, that in the end it might be um, residual services of last resort, if you want to call it that. And we know that basically services for the poor are often poor services. So how do you see that? How do you see that we could reverse that and stop it? And again, when you looked at some of the evidence this morning, the the pro-rich services or provision, it might be called, had been cut less, and there can be reasons for that, than the pro-poor services, the very pro-poor services. So, what what would your view? How what would your view be on stopping this going on? Well, it's investment. I mean, I think. You know, I mean, I, I think that does go. The, the core of it is about the money that's made available to provide services. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not quite, wasn't quite sure about the, the poor services element you, you were saying, but from from our point of view, that there are, you know, the, I think it's. I mean, if you look at our communities, if you look what's happening, and we've been taking a lot of uh, information from our branches around the 32 local authorities, and I mean, every one of them responds saying that their community, they're just the, the, the feel in the community is different now because our open spaces are not being able to be maintained. Uh, and people might not necessarily think these are important services, but they are about the attitude and the ability of a community to come together is often done by what it sees its local authority doing in its community. And, you know, it, it, you've seen wee pockets of the public responding uh, on a voluntary basis, but that's not a long-term solution, that's not an answer. So I think from, from our point of view, it's the key services that we're, we're providing local government, uh, if they go like the youth services, because they're almost decimated, and we're seeing, you know, police are reporting some, you know, youth crimes up. Uh, we're seeing more people attending accident emergency at the weekend, particularly young people, uh, alcoholism, etc. We believe that that's from the foundation, from the community. You know, if we had more community services uh, being provided, that these other services wouldn't be hit on. 
And I suppose for me, it's, if we're going to build in community cohesion, we have to ensure that the local provided services are well funded. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, changes to recycle collection, for instance. That's had a huge impact. You know, bins are lying outside people's houses for longer periods of time, uh, full, that's attracting vermin. And you're hearing that from the communities. I, my background is housing, and I worked in, a very, in an area of, of high deprivation in Ferguson Park. And the, the investment was put in the investment uh, to Ferguson Park did help in a sense, to the community cohesion. It didn't address all the issues by, by a mile, and there are still many issues. But certainly from the community's point of view, it brought them together. What, what I think happened, what, something was missed building on that, but I think that there is, there is if, the, the investment, if we, if, we go, if we keep cutting and cutting, our analysis is that there's nowhere else to go but the front line uh, now in local authorities. And that's what we've tried to protect. We've seen that in our local authorities. Some to protect the front line, but that is the next place to go. And I, I know my colleagues want to come in, so my final point would be this. Um, if our local authorities are unable to mitigate this with rises in council tax and increases in charges, or has there, has there got to be an answer from central government? My view would be a central government because, I mean, the charges, the council tax is one thing. I mean, obviously the ability for the councils to, to look at their own area, I think was right. I don't I don't believe the council tax freeze anybody benefited really from that because services were cut. What I do think is that the ability for councils to make decisions about their local area and the needs within that is certainly welcomed and each authority will need to that at its own merits and look at that in its own merits. Uh, in terms of, uh, I do think the answer is central, central funding. Charges, uh, when you increase your charges, you see a decrease in demand. So I don't know that that actually balances out. I, I've not seen any evidence from local authority submissions that we've seen that actually increasing charges has actually increased the revenue substantially to address the issues that we face. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I could supplement that, and I'll be, I'll be, very, I'll be very brief, um, and it is going back to the point about council tax and the percentage uh, amount that uh, council tax comes into the local authority. Uh, which is only something uh, in the region of 14, 15 per cent. So, so even by even by um, uh, raising council tax by three per cent, there's now a three per cent cap there. That's actually that's actually not generating a, sig a hugely significant amount of money into the local coffers. Uh, so you have to that that has to be taken into account. Whilst uh, the headline is uh, the removal of the, the the council tax freeze, the reality of how much uh, money that generates is something is something is something uh, uh, quite different. And I think uh, over the past um, eight, nine, ten years, uh, local authorities have tried very, very, very hard to 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 mitigate the the budget cuts that they have suffered. And uh, our evidence would suggest that uh, charges for local authority services are up somewhere in the region of 13% over that particular period of time. Okay. okay. Um, a few of us want to come in on this before we move on to the, ne the next evidence session. Can I just check? You mentioned council tax there. Now, if every local authority had increased their council tax by 3%, I think it would have been £70 million pounds extra to, to local authorities. But eight local authorities didn't, and that means there's £21 million pounds less in the system than there would have been. If you look at the council tax multipliers that were applied, that's an additional £110 million pounds a year. So potentially, in the last financial year, there's up to an additional £180 million pounds in the system out with the local authority revenue grant separate from that. Has that helped mitigate some of the issues? £180 million? Pounds? Any, any money in the system always helps to mitigate, but um, from, our, from our perspective... Um, the, the, council, council tax, uh, the council tax rise and the ability to raise the council tax by up to 3% doesn't go far enough because we're talking, we're talking about the, the holistic amount of money that council tax raises uh, within the whole of the local government budget. Mm -hmm. But £180 million pounds wouldn't be chicken feed. No, absolutely uh, And not. £21 million pounds when no. spent on specific local projects can still make real differences. Of course. So do, yeah. so do you not think the eight local authorities that didn't increase their council tax were wrong? To do that? Well, I can't. I can't speak for indi I can't speak for indi individual local authorities. They have. They have to base their budget decisions based on what's best for their for their particular needs. But I think uh, you'll find that uh, Unison Unison has consistently argued against the council tax freeze for the length of period that it was in place. But I mean, I, I mean, I find that confusing because 
this is all taxpayers' money. So the, so the Scottish government gets a block grant and then can tax and spend, and part of that spending is the revenue support grant to local mm -hmm. authorities. With the council tax freeze lifted, local authorities can do the exact same thing. So if you're just as rational as the, the Scottish government should have lifted the council tax freeze and should be giving more money to local authorities, then how can you not take a view on the eight local authorities that haven't increased their council tax? Surely you can't argue to uh, have a cap lifted on the council tax, a council tax freeze arguing that that's the wrong thing, and then when it comes in and you come here and you argue about the blight of financial support to local authorities, say that you have no view on the eight local authorities that decide to continue to freeze their council tax. That just doesn't add up. No, I, say, I, I said it was an individual view for these local authorities, the same way as it's been an individual view for each of the other local authorities in Scotland to raise their council tax by 1%, 2% or 3% according to their needs. Does Unison have a view? Unison's, Unison's view is that we did not support the council tax freeze, therefore, lo right. therefore local authorities would have the opportunity to raise the council tax as they so wished. Right, so do Unison have local branches in each local authority? They do. Do, do Unison and each local authority take a view? Uh, I, I, don't have that, I don't have that information to hand, so I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't sit here honestly and give you that view. Do you not think that would be a pretty important bit of information to bring to committee, Mr no. Black? That would be that would be your view, convener. It certainly would be. Let's look at some other figures that you you, you raise. Now you're, you're focusing on the the revenue grant. Now, uh, uh, and you're right that that's been under a lot of pressure, but your numbers don't include uh, over the lifetime of this parliament an additional seven hundred and fifty million pounds for the school attainment fund in the last financial year. The people equity funding part of that would be one hundred and twenty million pounds direct to school head teachers. Do you accept that will mitigate pressures on education? Because you make a big deal about education, and rightly so. First of all, I'd say that we focus on the revenue budget because that's what pays for the day-to-day -day services, and that that has been cut substantially. And even in the figures we were just discussing, we, we, we do get a bit black there. No, no, but could I ask you about your, your views on the the money is going to education through the pupil equity fund? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, that will, employ, any that will employ teaching assistants across the country for the next four or five years. Low-paid workers any doing money, valuable jobs. Any money going in, for the money from the attainment, of course, is welcomed, and we hope will make a difference uh, if the money is targeted at the right places within. That, that money is used uh, properly and is targeted towards uh, teaching assistants. I'm not sure that that's necessarily where it's all going, but what I would say is that any new money coming in is obviously welcomed. But right. uh, I mean, if, if there's a suggestion that the local government local government uh, finances haven't been cut, then I, I, I'm no, sorry, that I, I don't well, agree Mr. with that. Well, Mr. Fergus, it's important not to put words into my mouth because that's not what I'm suggesting. I'll have the exact same conversation with the Scottish government when they appear in front of the, the committee as well. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is we look at one part of local authority funding as part of our budget scrutiny, but this committee is trying to get a lot more nuance mm -hmm. in its budget scrutiny, and we appreciate that. You could say ring fence money is targeted at different parts of local authority services give a much more increased dynamic spending power in local authorities than the revenue budget uh, would suggest. I also accept, incidentally, that that means there's less flexibility because that's a type of ring fencing. Mm -hmm. So I accept both those, both those things. But what we have to do is get some information on the record to show that the revenue budget might not be the whole story. So let's look again at uh, other monies that Unison wouldn't include. So £250 million transferred from the health budget through to integrated joint boards, half of which is going to pay the living wage to social care workers. Would you think that that is an additional mitigation of pressures in local authorities or not? Uh, we welcome the, the Scottish living wage for social care. That was We made it very clear at the time and we certainly were calling for that. Uh, so yes, uh, the, the money that came from the IGVs, unfortunately, it isn't enough for the, the social care provision and the demands on social care. We have a social care crisis. Our members tell us that and all the evidence that we get in providing the, the social care services that are required. People are being, are being released from hospital into the community and it's the social care element that has to pick up that. So, yes, there's been some, some additional funding that has come through finally from, from the health budget towards uh, social care. But uh, it, it does not meet the needs of the services that are required. I'm not, not seeking to challenge that either. What I'm trying to get to a point of view where if Unison is looking at the revenue budget and there's wider monies at play, we've got to scrutinise the revenue budget, but also the wider 
monies as well. I'll take one more th final thing I guess from your evidence because you mentioned the attainment funding, your evidence, you mentioned uh, health service budgets in your evidence, you also mentioned the doubling of free childcare, saying that's other specific commitments out with the local authority revenue budget and flexibilities. But but childcare is one of the huge delivery mechanisms in local authorities. And we saw, uh, I think, something in the news the other month about a lot, uh, local authorities and partnership nurseries in the business of employing an additional 11,000 uh, childcare workers uh, by 2021. So is there a good news story to say at any point in local authority services? Is childcare one of the good things that's happening? We... The, in terms of the, ch the, ch the increase in hours, uh, the 11 40 hours for childcare, of course, we are welcoming new jobs coming in. If they are real jobs and they're jobs at a high level in terms of the quality that's provided, uh, we have a, a childcare provision within local authorities. And what we don't want to see happening is new tiers below the current rates or the current qualifications uh, workers be being brought in to, to, produce, to provide those services. I also note that the Scottish Government hasn't given a commitment until 2020 <coughs> on the provision of the living wage for a lot of these workers uh, that are going to be undertaking these duties, uh, which is clearly we would, we would expect to see that from the commencement of employment. I, that, that's really helpful, but can I just check something on that? Because those workers will be employed by local authorities, not by the Scottish Government. Um, so it's, it's technically not in the Scottish Government's gift, but the Scottish Government has got a significant influence over local authorities mm -hmm. to see the delivery of that, and social care workers would be the example of that. But that would you accept that? Yes, I would okay. accept that. But what I'm saying to you is, as it goes back to the other point on housing, about the needs, and when, when there's ring fence money comes in for a specific purpose, local authorities are unable to determine uh, what that, how that money is spent other than the priorities that have been set for it. So it goes back to your point earlier, Chair, when you said that you need to undertake a needs analysis. And I think that what we would like to see is that these additional monies come into local authorities for them to decide uh, under local democratic accountability how it should be spent across all these issues. And, uh, I mean, the issue, that what we're saying is there is nothing here that protects local government. We don't see a protection for local government only on the Scottish Government priorities. And I think that that's the issue that, that it goes back to. And it goes back to my earlier point. We need to be able to provide the basics for our communities in order to help and ease the pressure on the other services further down the line. And that we don't see that happening. Can I ask a final question? Then? And a couple, a couple of colleagues want, and then we'll close the evidence session. Um, would the unison position be, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, I genuinely, uh, well, just as robustly scrutinise the minister when they, he appears in front of the committee as well, I can assure you. Um, would the unison position be that the £750 million from the school attainment fund over the lifetime of the parliament, that the £250 million baseline per year health and social care funds into, uh, transferring from the NHS and any monies in terms of childcare, would your preference be that that money gets pumped into the core revenue grant of local authorities and they can just do what they like with it? I don't, I don't like to do what they like with it. I think that local authorities have to make an, a, take a needs analysis of what the requirements for their communities are. And I think that if they had more flexibility around some of these monies, then they could make improvements across yeah. a wider range of the community. Uh, I'm not saying the Scottish Government shouldn't set priorities, but when you set priorities and you ring-fence the money for those okay. priorities, I think that's where it mismatches, because the need might be different across the board. OK, let, let me rephrase that, and I apologise for phrasing it in such a way it was, it, it was, not, it was not neutrally phrased. Um, so the attainment fund monies, the integration fund monies, and any new monies for childcare, would Unison's preference be that that was put in the revenue budget of local authorities and local authorities decide what their local priorities were rather than having national priorities in these areas? We don't have a policy position as such on it, but <laughs> my own view would be that I think there should be more flexibility for local authorities to decide on the money that comes. Whilst there are priorities, I don't think the priorities should be set against an amount of money. I don't think that's the best use of public money anyway to do that. Right. OK. Um, Mr Gibson. I'm not really sure how in such circumstances a government could deliver its manifesto, but I, I want to go on to the Unison submission. I actually thought it was a really excellent submission in terms of, um, you know, looking forensically at the, the issues that local government faces in terms of resourcing it. Uh, but I was a, the reason I was a bit puzzled by it was because after four pages, 
of such information. The conclusion I thought was was um, was was um, modest, uh, to put it mildly. What you've said, and I quote, is no matter what the UK government decides in its budget which I think is a big caveat. The Scottish Government needs to use its full powers to ensure adequate funding to deliver these essential services and decent pay for the workers that the services rely on. But there is nothing in the submission that says what you mean actually by adequate. And I'm not sure how you... Uh, we, we all know what the budget now is, a £239 million real terms resource reduction uh, for the Scottish budget, but how would the Scottish Government be able to deliver regardless of what the UK budget had said? And can you tell us what adequate means? <laughs> Because we're talking about funding local government, how much do we need to fund it? Well, I think right. the, the point that's been made here is that we understand that the UK <coughs> government have, have had, uh, made cuts that have bad consequentials, and those cuts have come to Scotland. However, how the cut has then, how those those cuts have then disseminated within local government, sorry, in public the public services have been disproportionate, because each budget since the cuts the, the cuts have been happening, uh, we've seen a local government cut disproportionately more than the cut that's come from the UK government. So I think that that's the point we're making. We want to see adequate funding to provide the essential the services that local government are providing. And I think that's, that's what we mean by that. Well, in your submission, you're saying between 9 and 14% has been the reduction to local government. Now, the Scottish government will say that their resource budget's been cut by 8.1% over the same uh, time period, with 500 million cut uh, before that by the, the outgoing Labour government. So, therefore, if we're actually going to fund local government adequately, although you don't specify how much that sum might be, does that mean we should reduce money to the NHS or... Um, or how would we use the full powers, as you suggest? The Scottish Government is, uh, it must, by law, unlike Westminster, balance its budget every single year. We don't have control over VAT, excise duty, national insurance, dividends, all of which are reserved. So that effectively means we have to raise taxes or switch resources from other parts of the Scottish budget. So how would Unison fund the, the adequate settlement that it calls for? Uh, and how much would we have to put uh, either taxes up or switch money from other... Um, uh, areas of the Scottish Government budget. I mean, there's, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> there's no, there's, there's no doubt that uh, that the government will argue that uh, they have to set priorities in the allocation <coughs> of budgets to the various different uh, uh, parts of the public sector in Scotland. And you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, uh, sit here and uh, uh, tell you how to rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, as such, um, I, I think we are. I think what, um, what we uh, are, are saying is that there are areas that, uh, that the government could look at. They might not be short term, they might be much more longer term. Uh, the, the whole issue of um, a reform of local taxation, for instance. Uh, we've got a very firm belief that uh, the, 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 the local, uh, a new local taxation that uh, introduce the local property charges with uh, proper uh, with proper um, uh, reevaluation of bindings, etc., would be much more. We would place local government in a much. Would place local communities uh, in a much in a much more stable position. Uh, you have to also you have to also look at uh, at uh, the commitments that uh, I expect the government to give uh, on low-paid workers elsewhere in the public sector. And I take the point that was made previously, uh, local government pay is not in the give of the, the Scottish government. That's a separate negotiation with, uh, with COSLA. But uh, you know, a f part of the funding for local government would, in our view, uh, should be about fair funding for local government workers as well. Because uh, you know, in, in local government terms, these workers have fallen probably some 15 per cent uh, um, uh, below inflation over the past over the past eight uh, nine or ten years uh, but I think we need to uh, certainly as far as local governments concerned we need to get back uh, to, a, to a full baseline funding where we're not where we're not uh, uh, continually dropping that baseline to a level that quite frankly is not sustainable uh, any longer, because as Mark has already said, we've had the salami slice, and that's been going on and on and on. We're at the stage. We're at the stage now, uh, and uh, our evidence uh, in, in our paper to you has, has shown you some of the comments that have been made uh, by people that work in these services, 
and quite dangerous comments in, in, in some in some areas when you consider when you consider uh, uh, the impact that, that, that these services have. We have to we have to get to a position we have to get to a position where uh, that can't happen. However, we do that, we have to get to a position where that can't happen. I mean, I think I would agree with a lot of that, convener. I think my concern is that while we might all support local government reform, and uh, Mr. F uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Mr. Ferguson, sorry, talked about uh, new revenue coming in in the future, etc. The draft budget is in eight days, yes. and I'm really concerned that, given the, the the detail that was put into the Unison submission about the reductions in funding, etc., there is you're not making any financial suggestions about next week. You're not saying this is what tax should go up by, or this is what should be switched from other budgets. Um, this is how, how much local government needs to, you know, to fund, for example, inflationary pay rises, new pressures, whatever. And I'm really concerned that you've come here with telling us in great detail what the problem is, but we're not really getting any solution other than that one sentence about we need to use full powers and deliver adequate funding. It's not really giving us anything to, to work on, no matter how sympathetic the, the, the panel is. We, would really, we really need to know how much extra local government should get and where it, where that, it should come from. I understand that there's, uh, COSLA has said itself that to maintain service level at the current level, they're, they're calling for £500 million, just over £500 million. That's what they need to provide services at the current level. So that's a starting figure uh, for you. But what I would say is I believe it's about priorities because I've said, I've said before that uh, we, we're looking at the, the, public, the, the public services or the uniform services, and in no way would I suggest that you, you cut them, but what I'm saying is it's, I think there's a, a hope, there's a bigger issue. What I would like to see a budget that goes back to the basic core issues within our communities and the core, uh, the key issues that, are, uh, that our communities need, and for the workers to be adequately paid, resourced to provide those services, and I think that you know we've cut youth, uh, we've cut youth services substantially. They've been one of the, the hardest hit in local authorities, and um, it's no wonder that we're seeing children hanging about uh, play, play areas and various other places. And we've seen and there's been reports of crime up. We've heard from our colleagues in health who have said that accident emergencies under extreme pressure, uh, because you know there's, there's these the children in our community. There is no asp the aspiration has been taken away from them because yeah. we don't have the services at the level we used to have before. I mean, I, th I, th I, th I think, I think, I think, I think, I think you make, I think you make a passionate case yeah. very well. I, I think the frustration of the committee, but it's with everyone who gives evidence to this committee, is that we have to look at the number that will be before us next week and look to see how those numbers might or might not change. So that's our frustrations. That's why we pick away at that. And when we picked away at the COSLA submission about the funding gap, the standstill position included a 2.8% revenue increase for services and a 3% pay increase to staff. And we weren't sure whether they were including the £250 million integration monies. So that COSLA had a bit of scrutiny with the numbers they were coming up with as well. And we still have a little bit of a work to do ourselves before we take a view on, on COSLA's figures. One final question before we move to our next uh, 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 panel for, for evidence, uh, Mr. Simpson. Um, well, thanks very much. Um, you've been given a bit of a hard time here. You may feel that. Um, however, the, the, the message is, uh, as I'm hearing it, that year on year, budgets for councils have gone down. Um, you're paired to the bone. Um, if I can assist you on council tax, um, would, you, would you agree that the decision on whether or not to raise council tax, give, giving you the power to increase council tax does not mean the same as you must increase council tax. It's up to each individual council. And if a council decides not to, that does not mean that it is not getting less money from central government. Would you agree with that? Fair, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's all I have to say. Okay, now, thank you for the patience of other committee members, but I've, I've indulged myself with a line of questioning as well. So I, I thank all the witnesses uh, in relation to their time this morning. Please do follow our final evidence sessions. You will see a theme coming up where the, the government will be asked very similar questions about how they present their numbers and how robust those numbers are and what, what, what we think they should or shouldn't do going forward. So there's a consistency there in our line of questioning. It was quite difficult putting this panel together, but we wanted to give 
both sets of stakeholders the opportunity to put your views on the record and you've done that so thank you very much and we'll suspend briefly just to be moved to the next uh, panel Uh, welcome back everyone, we're still in agenda item one and uh, we move to our second panel on draft budget scrutiny 2018-19 as we continue to take evidence on the Scottish Government's uh, draft budget. Uh, can we welcome Robert Emmett, Director of Finance and Corporate Resources uh, at, at Ellen Sarr Council, he, he bottles out of the full pronunciation, I do apologise, uh, and Alison MacArthur, Head of Finance, Renfrewshire Council. A second um, apology for the length of wait these evidence sessions very much have their own dynamic um so it would have been discourteous not to allow that particular evidence session beforehand to run its course but it does mean that we're significantly late for yourself so our apologies in relation to that we'll move straight to questions with with uh, your permission and we'll move to graham simpson right uh, well thanks for coming you'll have heard the previous evidence sessions so, so follow, following on from that um uh, straightforward question. Do you think the amount of money coming to councils is enough? <laughs> <laughs> that, um, yes. Chair, the, the, the funding that, that we're expecting to, to receive for the quarter next year is not sufficient to continue to provide the same level of service um, that we're providing at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we are... We are within what we're expecting and what we're expecting to achieve within efficiencies for the next year. Um, if, if we have a 3% reduction in local government funding next year, for example, then that leaves us as a council with 3% um, savings to find through service reduction. So that's after finding a similar sum through, um, through efficiencies and, and things that we've already put in place that are going to happen. So it's not enough to continue to provide the same services if it continues like that and perhaps just to say one of the difficulties we have is we don't know and we won't know until next week what yeah. the settlement will be for next year so we are working though we've got some information we are working in the absence of any any figures either for next year or for subsequent uh, subsequent years um, yeah I, I would echo what, what robert he said there um in terms of having visibility over the medium term it's it's something that I think Audit Scotland have provided comment on, um, I think, in every audit report over recent years, um, that councils uh, must um, uh, endeavour to uh, provide medium-term financial planning figures, and that's it's not impossible to do, but it's more difficult to do in an environment where, you're, um, where your settlement, your, your main source of funding is, is allocated on a single-year basis. Um, but in terms of your original question, um, again, in, in terms of 
the totality of service delivery and the quality of service delivery that councils are able to achieve, I think undoubtedly there is going to be an impact um, in terms of future uh, settlements and the future level of income that councils can expect to receive over the medium term and that yeah. is something that every council will be planning to manage either through efficiencies or other other measures to try and uh, achieve a balanced budget position. Okay. Uh, appreciate you you're working blind as you as you are every year you haven't seen the the, the draft scottish budget yet but um all councils um will will make guess guesses of a, what what's coming they'll provide councillors uh with a range of options ahead of the budget you've probably done that already um so i wonder if um in each of you each of your councils if you give us an idea of the the sort of range of that sort of forecast range of cuts that you, you, you've been working with and the kind of services that you think may have to go. So, so we, we, we produce a, um, a projection which looks forward and we have a fan chart that says what are the range of probabilities that, that we are working to. And our central case is, is that we'll have a shortfall of about 6.7 million next year if you take all the things we know into account. And that's looking assuming that pay is at 2%, assuming a 4% reduction in grant funding, and that inflation continues to run at 2%, as well as new pressures that are coming through um, from um, changes, for example, in things like universal credit and how that, that we might expect that to affect us. So that, that's our, our base case. We think, obviously, that can go up. So if you put yeah. another percentage point on, on, on pay, that will obviously push it upwards. Um, if, if the grant settlement is more favourable than that, that will bring it down. And we have a range that goes forward. If we continue on the same trajectory, if you like, as we have for the last for the last couple of years, then we've been looking at saving something like 12 million, and that's about 12% of our budget over the next over the next two years. So that's kind of the the planning horizon that we're looking at. Right. What have we done? Um, we've looked at doing everything we can to reduce loan charges, to continue to seek efficiency. And if you look back, um, we've we've realised something like from the, of the 35 million we've had to save over the last period. Um, to balance the budget, about 19 million of it has been through doing things more efficiently. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes you can have a question about whether, you know, is rationalising two schools into one an efficiency or a, or a, or a reduction in service is a, is a point that perhaps you could debate. But through things which have not diminished the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, um, and the balance has been achieved, a, a sm relatively smaller sum in over the historically has been achieved through um, actually service reductions. But those have been, in some cases, quite po pri high profile removal of the Barra Bembecula air service being one of the ones that's perhaps attracted most attention but we're spending less on roads maintenance um, we've removed itinerant teachers so there's discrete things that have gone in the past and um, looking forward because there's so much uncertainty about where the figures are going to be we haven't started a public consultation exercise right. um, as to what that might be because I think it's very difficult to have a public consultation exercise about whether you're talking about a five percent saving or a ten percent saving but the reality is um, that work with with a working assumption that the teachers continue to be protected and the IJB continues to be protected and that the funding for new initiatives um, and and um, loans fund are fixed, then we're looking at making savings of about eight percent out of about forty percent of the budget. So the the bits of the budget which will which will um, suffer will be um, in the leisure services, in the roads, um, in non in non teaching um, education. Um, mm. those services which can be affected. And they're probably, I think, services that people are going to feel um, feel most strongly about and are going to be difficult decisions, I think. And public transport, I should have, I should have mentioned. And I think um, I, I managed a brief look at the, at the, at the um, SPICE briefing, which looked at the, you know, where the balance, who, who the balance of services affected. And I think increasingly that's going to be, because most of our services are towards the, um, I think pro-poor is, is that the adjective they use, mm. um, um, service they're increasingly going to be an impact on those on those services and just perhaps you were talking about, about housing in the earlier session um, increasingly there's a risk of supporting particularly where we are rural communities so so transport for example which is one of the discretionary services um, is vital to keeping people living in in rural and remote communities but it's one of the services that we're going to have to have to look at now, we have done some good work. We did a very um, successful piece of work on participatory budgeting um, the year before last, where we reduced the budget and we got people involved in redesigning the service. But in, in the very remote areas and the very remote islands, which I think some of you will be familiar with, 
reducing services becomes more and more difficult. When you're providing a minimum service at, at an optimum level, then the only changes to do it are to withdraw it or to, or to shrink it. So where we provide um, a, a leisure facility on Barra and we have a swimming pool on Barra, then, then you've got a, a fixed cost to providing that more or less. If you're going to, if you're going to um, make a saving out of it, it's going to be by it's going to be open less, or it's it's going to be, um, it's not going to continue. And that's that's I think some of the challenge that we're going to come um, come up against in the next period. But obviously, you can't get into that level of discussion on options like that until you know exactly what yeah. you're talking about, or you're going to have a very difficult um, um, community um, engagement process. I hope that's answered your question, Chair. No, that's very good. Mr. MacArthur. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I would echo much of what Robert said um, in terms of the information that we provide to elected members to allow them to, to have, have visibility of what the council's financial position is. Again, that is framed on a range of assumptions and broadly the assumptions that we have around about those key elements of the budget. So in terms of pay award, again, we, we are framing that on our central assumption of a 2% pay award for next year. A 4% cut in revenue grant, is again, is our central assumption for, for the coming year. Um, and, and inflation uh, continuing at, at, at its current small well, CPI is running at three percent. Hopefully, that will reduce slightly over the over the coming um, years, in line with Bank of England forecasts. But um, again, in terms of the areas of efficiency that that have been targeted, the the, the areas that that are a not necessarily targeted, but the areas that you can look to deliver efficiencies from, I, I think. Again, I, I managed a, a very, very quick read of, of the, uh, the the kind of key messages from the the spice briefing that was uh, I think issued this morning. Um, in the terms, of, you know, a large element of of the areas of efficiency have come from the back office, and I think that has been um, a, a key strand, certainly, of where Rainfisher has been over the past number of years. Uh, the vast majority of savings that have have come out have been we've tried to avoid having any impact on the front line, but I think we are reaching a stage where inevitably. Um, there will be some impact on front frontline services, and whether that is in in a quality terms or, or quantity terms, that is yet to be determined. Um, we are forecasting over the next coming years a, a financial outlook that will be presented to members uh, next week. At our leadership board, will outline um, a, a forecast a gap that is, is, has remained broadly similar over the past uh, year or two of around about a savings requirement of in the order of twenty million pounds. A per annum over the over the medium term. Right. Per, per year, twenty per, million pounds per year. Okay. So, I mean, are you are you are you getting to the point where you're having to cut um, or, or thinking of cutting statutory services, or are you, are you still is it still non-statutory that? Uh, we, we would always focus on non-statutory. Um, council has an obligation, obviously, through statute to deliver a whole range of services that we we. We, we wouldn't look to, um, a, which leaves uh, again a smaller rump. And I think this has been a, alluded to in previous evidence sessions that the, the areas of council service that are either non-protected or non-statutory, um, those are the areas that have been increasingly a, a targeted. And but the, the, our ability to, to drive efficiencies out of those particular areas without having an impact on, on, on as I mentioned earlier, the quantity or the quality of those services is is really starting to get impacted. Okay, so one final question, um, convener from me. Um, you both took a, a different decision last year on whether to raise uh, council tax or not. Um, so I think uh, Renfrewshire didn't didn't change the rate in Bandy, uh, but is it Western Isles. I can't pronounce it in Gaelic, unfortunately. Um, you decided to levy the full three percent. Can you tell me why you took those decisions? Um, but I, th I think it, the, the, the increase in council tax is largely a, a political decision that was taken by the administration at the time, and a, a, there was a, a, the administration had a commitment to not raising council tax um, in their view that that was uh, directly impacting on, on residents of Renfrewshire who were already hard pressed, hard pressed in terms of a, other financial demands. So that was the, the rationale for, for their decision at that point. Okay. Yourself. And I suppose again a political decision, but but in the previous years when the leader and I had been round communities consulting on what they thought we should do about the budget, there was a regular question about why you're not raising council tax, mm -hmm. and 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 having had a period of a freeze, the view of the council was this was an opportunity. 
you have to look at it in context. Council tax is less than 10% of our income. So a 3% rise is £300,000. It's not a huge sum of money. And in our case, the amount of money, because because by and large our properties are in the lower bands, the amount raised from the, the statutory change um, was about half, I think, of what of what was raised through the... Um, through the decision to raise an additional three percent mm. on council tax, but that was, you know, together that was an additional half a million pounds or so towards a challenging budget for the council, and it was in the position to 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 take that. And has there been any kickback from the public? No, we've we've not had any any um, any any negative feedback. I'm not aware of any responses um, in relation to council tax in that respect in the last yeah. year. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, no supplementaries on that one. Brief supplementary, Mr. Yeah, Gibson. Say how much did uh, Renfrewshire forego by not um, raising council tax um, in the election year? Um, each one percent raise in council tax generates about seven hundred thousand pounds. So if we had taken the full three percent, that would have been just over two million. Thanks. Uh, so we'll move on now, uh, Elaine Smith. So thanks very much. So thanks for joining us and for waiting to do so. Um, so. How well do you think councils are evaluating the impact that budget reductions have on specific communities, for example, vulnerable groups? So if you're happy for me to go first um, through the chair. The, the, um, all, all of our budget choices, and, uh, as, as we call them, decisions that go forward are subject to quality impact assessments. So we have a process. If you wanted to go online, you could go and have a look for them and see them all, where we try to identify what the impacts of anything that we're doing um, and if necessary, come back and revisit it. I think it's fair to say that because our officers are mindful of the duties they have in terms of equalities, that, that, that um, proposals come forward usually with that in mind. So there isn't, you, you know, when we do the work, um, it doesn't usually highlight anything, but there's a robust process to make sure any change that we're making is properly assessed and that's that's documented for members when they're making the decisions. Well, actually, I would like to ask you further on that specifically. Um, what issues... Could you tell us what issues have been identified with the equality impact um, approach and basically how they've been addressed as a consequence of that? Could I'm, you give I'm, us examples? I, I, don't think, I don't think that our process has ever brought up anything where we've had to make a specific adjustment to, um, to the proposal that's come forward on account of something that's come up through the assessment. And as I say, I think that's because officers have been mindful of that when they've been developing proposals that, that to, to, to um, seek to protect the most vulnerable um, in the work that we're doing. So your equality impact assessments haven't thrown up any particular issues? No, nothing, nothing, nothing. That's interesting. Mr MacArthur, would you have a similar um, um, Yeah, I, I think the approach in Renfrewshire is similar. Um, we, we would uh, undertake equality impact assessments on the, all, all the budget decisions uh, that are undertaken. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier on, much of the efficiencies that have been made to date and the savings that have been made to date have been targeted at, at services that aren't frontline delivery services, so in terms of an impact on any particular uh, constituency. Um, again, I suppose similar to Colin and Yelan Shia, we, 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 wouldn't, we haven't experienced any uh, significant uh, impact on one particular uh, area or, or vulnerable group um, that would demand that we would adjust uh, the efficiencies decisions that have been taken to date. Well, in terms of equality impact assessment, so if you're looking at protected characteristics, we heard in previous evidence that, uh, I think it was Unison raised, that they thought a lot of youth community services had been affected by cuts. So age, of course, is a protected characteristic. Would that be something that has been affected in your area? It's, it's not something that I have uh, experienced um, or not something I have knowledge of in terms of a it's not something in terms of the savings decisions that have been undertaken over the past years um, that they have been particularly targeted at, at that, that age group. Um, I would suggest that, if anything, that the work that we've undertaken through our Tackling Poverty programme has actually directed additional resource um, to, to younger people in terms of um, the Tackling Poverty programme that has been uh, rolled out and, and a, in terms of addressing, for example, costs of the school day and in supporting a, a family's first um, a approach to avoiding and mitigating a areas of, of a demand that the council sees further down the line. So as I think we outlined in our submission, the council has had a clear focus on early intervention um, as, as a way to try <coughs> and reduce demand and reduce costs. So could I just be clear here, are, are you saying the same as um, Western Isles, that there's no, that, that no 
particular issues with the quality impact assessments have been identified? Are you saying that, or that they have been identified and they have been addressed? I, I'm not aware of any significant issues have been raised in terms of the savings proposals that have been generated. Okay, interesting. Okay. okay. Any more follow-up on that? Yeah. Well, I think Alexander did specifically, no, no, and then no, I've got more nothing questions. Yourself? No, okay. Alexander Stewart. Can I just do a supplementary on that? I mean, obviously, when you have your budget review group, you would look at the efficiency savings you would have, and you would potentially look at the knock-on effect that would have to the services that you supply with the supply and demand of whatever that service may be. You've indicated today that, that you, you feel that that's not had a massive impact uh, on, on the supply and demand and the service quality. Is that the case across the board or just within specific areas? No, I, I, sorry, if I, if I can just kind of clarify. I, 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 w I wouldn't suggest that it hasn't. The savings that have been agreed to date haven't had any impact. Um, there has obviously been an impact in terms of the operation of the council. However, what the, the savings that have been generated to date, we have targeted as far as possible back office and mm -hmm. non frontline services. So, so that has been potentially redeployment of staff. Uh, staff so management processes within uh, efficiency to technology or something of that nature so that in reality no, not the frontline service has not been dramatically affected um, I, I, I would suggest and I, th I think the, the spice briefing I was issued this morning would hopefully kind of echo that that in terms of the, the areas of saving that that we have been targeting have largely been back, back office uh, but as I mentioned earlier on, I think we are coming to a position where in, in the very near future that isn't simply not going to be a sustainable approach mm -hmm. and we are going to have to make some very difficult decisions. Our elected members will need to make a and And, and within decisions your financial planning, you would have a short term, a medium term and a long term solutions to some of these situations that you're looking at. Uh, and you'll also be looking at the potential of forward planning with potential budgets for the next years coming ahead and you've identified now that that's where the problem's going to arise even more than it is today yeah i i would say that over the i wouldn't suggest that we have solutions but we have forecasts in terms of what the potential position could be assuming a range of assumptions hold through in terms of some of those key areas around pay award and the level of grant support that we receive from the scottish government and around council tax uh, which are obviously our, our key levers in terms of addressing the, the financial position now over the medium term. And with and with all local government, it's the political decision at the end. You make a recommendation, it's or you indeed, make a suggestion. Indeed, yeah, we, we we can we can arrive at a range of options that elected members. Yeah, you give them you give them an option menu, and it's up to the political uh, administration uh, within your organisation to then make those decisions on your assumptions. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Emmett, did you want to add anything? Don't feel the need to. Just, just before. Uh, just, I suppose just, 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 just to be clear, I mean, I, I think over over um, the period since the financial crisis, about 10% of our cuts, are, are, our savings, sorry, have been through service reductions, and it would be wrong to say there isn't any impact. There hasn't been any identified impact on any particular groups as a consequence um, of that. I think is that is the. Um, but there has been an impact. But there will, have, there will have been an impact. Now, I think as a council, our aspiration is to minimise the impact and to do the best job we can with the resources available but there's no doubt that for example you know if we're spending a million pounds a year less maintaining the road in the long term the condition of the roads mm. will deteriorate people probably aren't yet at the stage where that necessarily are feeling that impact we've had an awful lot of discussion about the removal of itinerant teachers and specialist music teachers um, and though we're looking at different ways of delivering that service there still is an impact to the people who were previously who were previously um, dealing with those but that's you know we've done a lot more on efficiency in the period behind us. I think the challenge going forward is that is the balance is going to shift to being much more an impact on on those services rather than on um, on efficiency. Thank you. Which leads us in to the again the whole um, service redesign, the impact on staff and the quality of service they're able to provide. And I would specifically like to ask Mr MacArthur on this um, your evidence talks about a decision to shift to a digital first model and approach to customer service. Um, but in doing that, how does that then impact on more vulnerable groups who who find that very difficult, the, the digital first approach? They find it impossible, perhaps. Yeah, we, we, we absolutely recognise that a digital first approach will not work for everyone. Um, the Council agreed a, a customer service strategy 
uh, only last month um, and that absolutely recognises that a digital first approach will not work for everyone which is why council will always have options in either in terms of telephone support or, or you know, front, front office um, a, a, a customer service centres across the, the, the county um, that will remain available for members of the public who don't find that a digital first approach is the best approach for them. In which case, on that specific issue, if you equality assess that, have you put in additional monies for vulnerable groups? Well, in terms of the changes that we've made to date, in terms of trying to implement you know, a, a customer portal, for example, and encouraging, for example, planning applications or changes in address or um, applications for a council tax reduction for so, so on, um, we have a, absolutely, in terms of putting those plans in place, we do recognise within the changes that we're making that a digital first approach will not work for everyone and we will always have routes, uh, other routes available for members of the public to, to contact us to, to make those changes if required. Presumably though, that allows you to downsize staff taking a digital first approach. Uh, is that where your savings would be made? Uh, that, that, that is one area where savings have been generated uh, in the past. Okay, and can, on the wider issue, can I just ask um, whether councils then, for both of you, whether councils see increasing fees and charges as a way of offsetting budgetary pressures? Is that something that they, they, they think they, they can do? Not, not significantly, Chair. The, 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 uh, echoing perhaps what Unison was saying, you know, where we are, we're a low-wage um, economy. Um, the fees and charges principally come through um, services. If you start putting up the fees and charges, one of our single biggest things is, is, our, is our leisure facility membership scheme. So if we put the charge up on that, we will lose people out of it, and we will also lose the wider, the wider, um, the wider health benefits. So in the scheme of can we fix our budget gap by putting up um, fees and charges, um, no, that's not a solution. And in fact, we've done a bit of work on car parking, for example, this year, which is actually demonstrated that we're perhaps even on a tipping point in terms of, you know, people are, are avoiding paying car parking charges and parking, um, t changing their parking habits, if I put it like that. And that's a relatively small measure. So people are mindful of it. And I think I'm mindful we're in, you know, we've got a low GDP economy. That's, there's not the capacity um, to raising significant additional money from um, citizens. And actually, you mentioned health there. So there's a cross, there's cross cutting issues because if you do that and the impact on people's health, then that would have a corresponding impact on the health budget. And, and, and we're, <coughs> the council's very mindful of that. We, we introduced our slange of our scheme I'm trying to think maybe five years ago now and it was a it was a it was a um you know we were moving from everyone pays as they come in to a standard membership and we weren't sure at the time exactly how it would work out it was highly successful in terms of the take-up and participation in sport particularly for young people and that's something the members are very mindful of in terms of in terms of um in terms of their own you know that wider strategy okay thanks Mr. McArthur, do you want to add anything um, to that? Yeah, I, again, um, similarly to, to what Robert said there, fees and charges, are, it's, not a, a, it's not going to present a solution for us in terms of the, the size of the funding challenges that, that we have. Um, I think in total fees and charges uh, to, to organisations and, and members of the public locally in Renfrewshire raises, raises something like £10 million. It's not, you know, raising that by a couple of percent is not going to address the, the size of the challenge that we're facing. Yeah. Of course, yes. Just, just the fees and charges also impact on the business sector. So one of the areas where, I mean, we have been raising charges higher than inflation is in relation to um, pier and harbour dues, and that of course puts pressure on businesses who are using those pier and harbours. So there's always there's a balance there, and the capacity for businesses to absorb increases in in prices, not just suppose not just individuals, as the point I'm making, is limited um, when we're trying to support you know the whole economy. Okay, thank you. No. The, the observant amongst what Mr Whiteman's had to leave committee to go to another committee for, for duties he has there. I know Mr Whiteman and Mr Gibson had a, had a number of issues they were, they were keen to raise. Uh, Mr Gibson, you could take some of those forward? Yeah, I, I've got a couple of questions that Mr Whiteman asked me right. to ask on his behalf, but I'll just ask a couple m myself first, if that's OK, convener. I mean, I mean, I mean it was interesting Mr MacArthur just talked about, about £10 million pounds raised from uh, raising Renfrewshire um, through fees and charges, so by foregoing a 3% council tax, equivalent to about 20% of that? A arithmetically, yes. Yeah, thanks. Now, housing, um, you've said in your submission, Mr MacArthur, under question 8, you've said basically that the subsidy councils receive 
uh, for new build homes £57,000. However, our RA sales received £70,000, an increase in subsidy to match that of RA sales would have a significant impact on the level of new build housing councils can deliver. I'm just wondering what sort of impact that would have in Renfrewshire. Um, th th that's not a figure that I would have uh, to hand. Uh, I, I, I would need to consult with my colleagues within the housing department. But um, in terms of our strategic housing investment plan, my understanding is that if, if the level of subsidy was increased, <coughs> then that would obviously reduce the demand of, for council resource uh, to, to, to fund and council resource um, within the, the rules around HRA investment, um, that, and that being balanced, being balanced uh, in its own right from rental incomes, then uh, I think that would increase uh, the, the number of houses that Renfrewshire could produce, uh, could build over the, the, the coming uh, period. But in terms of the exact numbers, that's something I could I could consult with back uh, with my council housing colleagues and provide that to the committee. But it could mean the decision be some, pro some projects going ahead or not. I, 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 I think it's not—it's not an area that I, I'm right. particularly close to, but it's—it's it's something that I, I can absolutely take back and, and provide a response to the committee uh, once I've consulted with the housing colleagues. Thanks, convener. And, 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 and Mr. Emmett, uh, you, you've basically said that uh, you welcome the allocation of resources for housing and believe this is an essential component, particularly in rural areas, for retaining population and jobs. And you consider it's essential that housing funding is permitted to be used flexibly to prevent the significant higher cost of building housing in island locations acting as a barrier to development and consequently population retention. And I notice that uh, funding in, uh, um, in terms of the uh, resource planning assumptions is going to increase from 7.533 million in next financial year, I don't know if this financial year is some from space, uh, to 9.092 million pounds, that's some, a 20% increase. So I'm just wondering uh, what impact that will have and what you mean by, um, I think I know this because I've got an island in my own my own constituency, but what you mean by um, flexibility in terms so, of so using spend here? Um, there's a few, thi a few things, and I suppose I suppose the biggest the biggest challenge for us is is being able to develop in in um, in the rural um, in the rural areas. And I know you talked earlier on about the difficulties about make having land available, and and traditionally it's been easier to get land and to get sites and to get development to happen in and around. Um, stone away than in some of the remote places and down in um, down in the Southern Isles then then you're looking at something like 50% more to build a house than anywhere else but you're not just looking at that you're looking at difficulty getting people to come and build houses mm. um, so being able to deliver the, the ship is a balance I think between being able to deliver things that we know we can deliver to get the houses delivered and trying to achieve the council's objective which is very much and they were talking about this yesterday very much around trying to get houses into remote into ro remote and remote remote rural island communities um, and and where you know there is I know there's benchmarks around what the cost contribution is and and um, the government's been very supportive of thinking of looking at being flexible about well, what's the contribution that makes them make this scheme um, this scheme work I think there's still opportunity to look at more inventive um, ways of supporting people who want to live in communities and and there's a particular challenge where you've got properties where the cost of building the property will exceed the value of the property when it's built so, so you know, if you've got, if it costs one hundred and eighty thousand pounds to build a house, but actually you couldn't sell it for that when it's been built, um, then then you've got a difficulty with someone coming in and trying to buy it. Now, the council has been involved in, in a, at a small scale with small places where there's a there's a, a person in Harris, for example, building a house which they're going to live in, and that's what we want, rather than people who are going to build houses and they're going to be um, holiday cottages. Um, so, finding finding innovative solutions, and I think. You know, to be fair, entirely to the government, that's that's there's a lot of support for the work we're trying to go, is important. But that's doesn't get you your numbers. So if you're looking for a big number of houses to build in a short period of time, it takes longer and it's more expensive to deliver a smaller number of houses, and that's the conundrum we're up about. But we're very much, and I hope the government is about trying to keep people in communities. And if there aren't houses, that's going to be the first step. And if there aren't services, so if you haven't got broadband as well as your house, for example, you're going to really struggle to get a family to move in there. Um, to live there and, and, and can use that money for example to refurbish rather than rebuild because certainly that allows um, not just the, the uh, perhaps reductions in the cost but also maintains some of the kind of traditional look of some of the houses and villages rather than perhaps looking at something that could be in you know 
And, and Chair, mm -hmm. I think that's all in the mix. The cost and availability of the housing is we we um, took the step of using the power to to, in to increase a double council tax on um, empty homes, particularly to try and bring more of them back into use, and that's had some success. Um, but there's of there's still a number of properties, for example, with people who are in care, where where it is a challenge working out how to get those properties um, properties into use um, and not to deteriorate in condition. Convener, that's my question. I just wonder, Mr. Whiteman was asking if I could ask a question um, about short-term nature of funding, if that's okay. Um, in his absence, uh, um, I, um, for example, um, again in the uh, uh, Mr. in your um, submission, you said the budget review group, medium and long-term financial, financial plans for all sectors would help councils in the strategic planning, and you expressed concern that the notification of single-year settlements in mid-December reduces the opportunity for medium, meaningful engagement with communities i'm just wondering what impact this has on your ability to plan ahead and perhaps you could also answer this question as well mr MacArthur. i i think i think that as a council we've always worked hard to try and work within the funding we've we've got and to do our best but if we're if we're uncertain about what's coming then we can't plan for the best use of resources so so if we know um we're looking at we've got to set our budget well we meet to set our budget in in february i know we have technically a little longer than that but actually if you only learn in December what your settlement's going to be and if it's only for one year you're conducting a single year exercise um, in a short period of time to try and w agree what you're going to do now if you're in a period of growth if you cast your minds back to when we had the first three year settlement and five percent growth some considerable period ago it feels then that's not such a challenge but when you're in a period of service reductions you don't want to be having a conversation with the community our budget's reducing this year and then going back the next year oh, it's reducing some more next year because you really want to be say to redesign the service I've been working with our council to try and say, can we plan for the whole term of the council? Can we plan a budget that decides what we're going to do so we don't go back every year and talk about cuts, but we do, um, we decide what we're going to do and we do it and then we focus on the positive things. Now, there are some positive things, as you'll know, you know, there's things that we are doing, you know, with, with East Gold and with education where we are really trying to say there's a different way of delivering services that can be better. Um, but you've got, I think the process would be better if we had some indication that our settlement for the next period was... There. Now, I think my own view is that there's a capacity to do that. The UK government had set out four-year plans, you know, when it came in into office. Um, that didn't translate through into, into longer-term plans um, within Scotland, accepting that they could change. And there's a series of commitments that the government's made through its manifesto that it's, that it's committed, to, committed to delivering. Um, I know you talked a little bit earlier about transparency. Being clear about this funding coming in for... Um, expanding preschool education that means there's a consequent impact on is it coming from local government where's that coming from having it having clarity across the piece as to what we're expecting and how it's being funded i think would help i suppose everybody buy into it i, I accept it's for the government and for the council to make their own choices about what those priorities are but as officers working within the scheme to know the framework that you've got would make it i think we'd make better decisions if we had clarity about what we were um doing chair um, I, I, I didn't have anything more, more particular to add over what, what Robert outlined there. Um, I, th I think it would help uh, councils enormously, if, particularly in, in an environment where uh, overall resources are reducing, if we had a better visibility of just to what extent those resources might be reducing by. And then the councils can plan uh, to, in, in conjunction with, with their communities and their community planning partners to try and address those challenges. In a, in a much more structured way um, than a, potentially is, is the case that we're, avail that we're able to do a, at the moment. And that, that would allow us to potentially invest in areas of transformation that would, would potentially deliver over a much longer period, but we would have visibility over how we would potentially bridge that gap in the shorter term. Um, so yes, it would be enormously helpful to, to have that visibility. Although, of course, the Scottish Government doesn't always know its own budget, you know, until the Chancellor stands up at the dispatch box, which makes it uh, difficult from, from their perspective. Thanks, Kenya. OK, and more questions in that area. Any further questions? OK, well, given the fact that you've had a, quite a significant wait, we're, we're about to close this particular evidence session. Is there any particular comments that either of you would like to put on the record before we formally close this particular evidence session? I, th I think the only thing I would add, Chair, I think, is that, is that one of the areas where, in an island community, we think there's an opportunity is to look at look at um, the single island authority 
type of model. There isn't the opportunity for shared collaboration across councils, perhaps in the same way as there might be in Ayrshire or somewhere where you have a number of councils who can collaborate. And we think that the best um, public sector economy is through, if you like, an area or place-based collaboration around the islands. So that's, you know, going forward, that's where there is an opportunity potentially. And there are, you know, some potential efficiencies, but not just not just that, but the opportunity to um, make sure the services are best designed for um, for the citizens. So that, you know, as an opportunity going forward, I think that's perhaps worth having in mind, Chair. Well, can you hold on to your thoughts, Mr MacArthur, because Mr Gibson made a late bid to ask a Yeah, thanks very here. much to let me inconvenient. No, it's just on the base of that. I mean, I mean, obviously one of the things about Western Isles is 20 or 1,000 people when you've got, you know, you've got a health board, you've got a local authority, integration job, it would not be better if it was all within one structure. And, and I think that's very much the chorus position is that is that there's a real opportunity there. There are challenges because of the way those different, um, you know, particularly the NHS and the different organisations um, work. But very much the chorus view would be there's an opportunity there to, to look at how we best provide services for, as you say, a small population and a huge geographic area. OK, thank you. OK, and Ms McCarthy, your opportunity for any closing comments? No, I, uh, but I suppose in a similar vein, uh, it's something that within Renfrewshire we have been attempting to do over the, the, the past couple of years as we move forward in a much more structured way with our community planning partners um, in, in arriving at, you know, I, I suppose a consolidated view about what the total resources are available within the Renfrewshire area and how we can best use those resources to, to address the issues that the local communities uh, have, um, whether that is... is, is a, it's, it's maybe not the same as, as a potentially a single organisation um, that would deliver public services as, as what Robert has potentially suggested there. Um, but in terms of that, a wider, more, much more community planning based approach rather than each individual public sector organisation doing its own thing and planning in isolation. Um, that's something that we're certainly trying to, to, to overcome. OK, well, thank you for putting that on the record. I think the committee is very, very conscious that... Um, both of yourselves as witnesses work within an environment where you, you, you're driven by not just the numbers but the policies of the administrations of which you have to forward plan on that basis and our questions hopefully reflected how you have to work your way through that process irrespective of the numbers that flow from Scottish government. So thank you for giving evidence to our committee uh, to help us understand that process better. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. That ends agenda item one and we'll suspend uh, for a short comfort break before moving to agenda item two. Thank you, gentlemen.
So we now move to uh, agenda item two. Uh, it, we were joined by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland for the annual report on accounts 2016-17 and the committee will take evidence on the Commissioner's annual report and accounts. As members will be aware, the Standards, Procedures and Public Appoints Committee will also take evidence from the Commissioner on his annual report and accounts at this meeting uh, next week. So can I welcome Bill Thompson, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland, as well as Claire Gilmore, Senior Investigating Officer, and Ian Bruce, Public Appointments Manager, Office of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland. Understand there's no opening statement, so... Yeah, OK, uh, uh, thank you for that, Mr Thompson. We'll move straight to questions. And I think we'll get Graham Simpson to kick us off. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, convener. Um, so you've uh, spent in one year uh, £949,000, um, dealt with 224 complaints. Uh, only 18 of those uh, were found to breach, uh, breach any sort of code. Uh, that's uh, less, less than one in 10. Um, if you do a crude breakdown uh, based on what you've spent to those 18 cases, that's about £53,000 per case that uh, ends up uh, as a breach. Um, do you know what the so so the, the vast majority of, the, of cases that you dealt with uh, were not a breach. Um, do you not know think this is a colossal waste of money? There's nothing like a diplomatic okay, question to open up an evidence session. Mr Simpson, who would like to respond in terms of value for money and uh, uh, of the yeah, office? Mr Thompson. Um, I've been asked a question of this nature before. Last year. And I pointed out that one third of my budget is not even spent on conduct complaints. So I'm disappointed that that wasn't registered. So even on the crude calculation, the figures are wrong. And it implies, or behind it, I think there's an implication that the complaints which don't go forward as breaches are valueless. And I'm not sure that the people who submitted those complaints would agree with that. Thank you very much. Do you want to follow up on that, Mr Simpson? Yeah, it's a very, uh, very brief answer. Uh, uh, the, the point I'm making is... Uh, Every year, in fact, not just this year, every year, um, you'll deal with um, hun hundreds of complaints, but a tiny amount, a tiny amount, end up uh, that there's a finding of a, a breach. Now, surely you'd, you'd have to accept that a large percentage of, of those complaints are simply spurious. Um, for I mean, you're looking puzzled, but the biggest number... Um, Come, uh, are, are under the category of disrespect. Now, disrespect uh, can, be, can mean all, all, all sorts of things, but it could be uh, a mild insult. Um, I could, uh, I could uh, mildly insult Mr. Gibson here to my right, and he could issue a complaint that you'd have to deal with. Uh, that's costing the, the taxpayer money, uh, but it would be an entirely spurious complaint. So. My, my point is, um, aren't we wasting a lot of money dealing with the complaints which are frankly of a trivial nature when we end up with only 18 out of 224 uh, where you've found uh, there, there is a breach? Can I ask that, Mr Thompson? I think what would be quite helpful for the committee to know, Mr Simpson, is whether or not, because anyone can make a complaint, but it's whether there's a filtering and gatekeeping process that decides how, how quickly some complaints are processed and investigated the ones that are not uh, actioned or investigated in any greater detail, is there a sifting system that you go through as part of that? Because <coughs> Mr Simpson is talking about potentially spurious complaints. That would be quite helpful to know, I think, Mr Simpson, as well. Uh, yeah. Yes, convener. Um, I mentioned last year that uh, we had introduced what uh, a process which I called initial office assessment, um, and we still run that process. Um, and that is the, as it says, initial assessment when the complaint comes in. Um, some are entirely outside my jurisdiction. Um, they may not even relate to councillors. They may relate to things which are entirely outside the role of councillors and therefore not covered by the code. 
Um, this respect, I agree, um, can cover a very broad range of things, some of which are certainly trivial. I'm not sure that I would call them spurious. Um, I think if somebody goes to the trouble uh, of making a complaint, they, they rarely regard it as spurious. Um, some of these end up um, with the councillor against whom the complaint has been made being suspended. Um, and these are not, I would suggest, in any way trivial or spurious. But I can see that if the political will of the Parliament is that time shouldn't be spent on that, um, that's an option you have in terms of legislation. Well, we might come on to that, but if there's, a, well, we will come on to that, but there are, uh, there might be supplementaries. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Um, and it, it just occurred to me during that line of questioning, uh, Bill, and thank you for coming to join us. But it, it occurred to me to ask you whether, and I, I wasn't sure if there's anything in your report, and I don't think there was, whether you have got any ability to deal with particularly vexatious, vindictive, politically motivated complaints. Is there any any way you have of dealing with that? If you if you if you notice that that's what it is, or you came to that conclusion? I don't. In terms of the legislation. Um, I did come to the predecessor committee uh, a couple of years back uh, and suggest that there might be some sort of order of priority of cases um, which would allow some not to be followed through. Um, it didn't <laughs> find favour with the committee, I think it's fair to say. Um, so at the moment, I'm in a position where I'm required to investigate all complaints that come to me, regardless of the motivation. Um, they, on average, over five years, 80% of the complaints come from members of the public. Now, that doesn't mean they're all unconnected to the political process, um, but the complaints, we're talking about councillor complaints here, um, the complaints which come from councillors over that period average about 19% of the total. Um, and some of those are very clearly politically motivated, and some of them may well be tit for tat. Um, it doesn't mean, of course, that the subject of the complaint is irrelevant, spurious, or, or trivial. It may actually be quite serious. No, and I'm actually, I wasn't even asking about that, because what, what, what some people might consider irrelevant or trivial, other people would consider extremely serious. Um, but I suppose it's just, I'm, I'm trying to explore the issue of the more vexatious ones and whether or not there would be any recourse. It, it, it's some way of putting people off making those kinds of complaints, I guess, is what I'm exploring. The, well, uh, if that were to be done, I think I would need some authority to do so. And as things stand, you don't. I don't. Um, what I can say is that I don't have a number of regular complainers. Um, over the years, there have been some elected members who have put in quite a number of complaints. Um, and there tends to be also a number of complaints against those same individuals. Uh, it seems to be a way of working. Um, I, I'm not in that position at the moment. Okay, thanks. It's not like petitions to the Parliament in the early days when there were people who would read the newspapers and decide, oh, I must put in a petition about this or that, and you'd get 20. We're not in that position at all. Okay. Mr. Thompson, there's something you mentioned. I apologise, actually, the clerk that drew it to my attention, so I'm sorry that I missed it. And one of your, your replies you mentioned about if you sought to prioritise uh, or have a hierarchy of complaints, I'm, I'm not sure what the terminology would be, that that's not something in your in your power. You have to treat each individual complaint in the same way through the same process and the same mechanism. Would you be seeking the ability to prioritise different categories of complaints in different ways, I'm just wondering. At the time I made the suggestion, the number of complaints was going up almost inexorably, um, and I was concerned um, that it wouldn't be possible uh, to handle them all without either significant additional expenditure or else limiting those which were looked into. Um, I think I have a general statutory power to decide whether or not to investigate a complaint. Uh, but of course, I'm covered by the general law, uh, administrative law. So if I act unreasonably, um, 
I would be subject to, rightly, uh, potentially um, judicial review of decisions. Now, I accept that would be an extreme position to adopt, but I don't want the office to be in a position where it's being legally challenged all the time and spending a lot of effort and money defending or responding to legal challenges um, rather than what we do at the moment, which is filtering complaints and only investigating those which appear to have substance. Okay, that, that's helpful. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask, but I can hold them back. Other committee members want to ask any questions yeah, at this yeah, point, Mr Gibson? About credibility, about credibility and consistencies. Two, two MSPs sitting next to each other, both fail to declare an interest. Somebody walk, watching on telly at home decides to raise a complaint about one of those members not declaring an interest, but doesn't raise the issue about this. The other one, who's also failed to declare an interest, perhaps on the same issue, and, and I've corresponded with you with this, as you know, and you will investigate the person where there's a complaint being made about, but if the other person's not been complained about, even though that person has failed, uh, allegedly, not to declare an interest as well, th that just doesn't even get considered. I mean, where's the consistency? How's, where's the credibility of the system in such a thing? Surely you investigate all cases where this is supposed to have happened um, uh, or none, rather than just, well, maybe complained about that person so they can just, you know, um, no bother declaring an interest, whereas somebody complained about you, so we will investigate it. And by the way, we'll take eight or nine months to do it. And I, it was in my case, yeah. I'm really, <laughs> no, and in serious, I'm really, really embittered about it, actually, to be perfectly honest with you, actually, about the whole process. Right. That, you I know, but I won't get into any detail, no, but that's, that's, that, that, that's the crux of it. You know, two people do the same thing, but one gets investigated and one doesn't. He? So, Mr. Thompson, reflections on that? <coughs> um, first, the lawyer's answer. Um, the second person allegedly did the same thing. Um, it may not have been investigated um, to the point where it's been established. Um, and I think it's probably the case with most regulatory systems outside totalitarian states that it is the, thing which come to the things which come to the attention of the regulator which are investigated. Um, I don't... If, if you wished my role or somebody else completely different... Um, to be to go around investigating any potential breach, um, they would have to operate in a completely different way. I, I mean, I'm obviously familiar with Mr Gibson's circumstances and I'm not going to go into the detail of that. I understand the reason why he's irritated by it. Um, but I think it's quite a step from the system we have at the moment where anybody can make a complaint, which I appreciate may mean some are spurious to use Mr Simpson's word, um, to one where they regulator effectively goes looking for trouble um, and, and investigates things. I mean, to be blunt about this, there is nothing stopping somebody in the position that Mr Gibson felt himself to be in making a complaint about the other person. Mr Gibson, I actually have a supplementary I'd like to ask on this specific question, but it's very personal to you. Would you like to explore this further? I'm just, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I wouldn't be prepared to make a, a complaint about someone that I don't feel is worthy of investing, investing huge amounts of public money in. But particularly given that these things happen in the chamber, you know, at least once a week, sometimes more than once a day, and the presiding officer says that's a matter for the individual member. You know, so I, I, there's no way I would complain about, a, a, about a, a member, given that that's the circumstances when it happens in the chamber. Um, frankly, okay. So <laughs> just, just <laughs> wonder, sorry, Mr. Thompson, do you want to? Uh, I mean, on that? if others agree with that, why, why <coughs> would there be any expectation that I or some successor to me would investigate it? Well, in my view, there wasn't. <laughs> so I, I just wonder, can we take it to the general, away from the specific? Let, let's assume. One of us in here is asking a line of questioning and there's a direct interest we have that we don't declare, maybe deliberately, maybe just oversight, um, and a complaint comes in. You would then have a duty to investigate why that wasn't declared. Um, but there could have been, yet. Yeah, there's now five members left at this committee just now, and theory, the five of us could have done the same thing at the same meeting. I'm just wondering in terms of consistency, Mr Thompson, whether there could be a permissive power given to yourself to make sure that the environment, that, that you actually investigate the general context of that debate 
to see if there is more than one person. So you actually investigate the conduct of all members at that particular meeting. And tell. There must be a way of getting a, a general context to this, rather than one person being singled out for specific um, targeting. So that's probably a crazy idea that I've suggested, but the expression I did use was more permissive powers to investigate more widely. In other words, if a complaint doesn't come in, and it comes to your attention in the course of an investigation that there was four or five elected representatives didn't declare interest for whatever reasons, surely for consistency purposes, you should look at that in the round rather than focus on one individual? Can I ask that question? We can maybe get an answer to that one and then you could come back. Same yeah. Um, it's not a power that I am seeking. Um, it would cost money. That's a pretty short answer, so our deputy convener can come in and ask it differently. So yes. can I ask it differently? If you were then investigating that one person, but in the course of your investigation you were aware that the other four had done the same thing, would that then reflect on the way you dealt with the complaint? It, I think, would be a circumstance which I would narrate when I'm reporting. Remember, I don't make the decisions ultimately. I report, if we're talking about <laughs> um, MSPs, I report to the SPPA committee of this parliament. Um, and I would expect... If that had come out, and if I had reported it, which I think I would have to do, um, I would expect that to be taken into account by the okay. committee when looking at it. And when we're dealing with councillors, um, I have actually been in the situation where I've encountered something, investigating one complaint. Um, <laughs> in the particular circumstances, the actual complaint wasn't substantiated, but something else had happened. So I reported on the other thing which was uncovered in the course of the complaint. Even okay. though the person wasn't complained about in relation to that? Well, they were complained about, um, and I'm bound to say it wasn't uh, hugely welcomed <laughs> so it when I did. What, so it, Mr Thompson, it doesn't matter. So if someone makes a complaint against me for pronouncing the Gaelic for Western Isles wrongly today, and you go, oh, that's just ridiculous, really out of order. Aha, but that Doris one in the, in the, in the, the general research into relation to that I found something else he's done that that, that would then go forward I'm no, not sure what you mean by that I, I misled you convener it wasn't as wide as that it, um, it was more like to take your example um, mispronouncing some other word okay it was a related issue right, I, I'm, yes I'm just trying I think what we're trying to tease out is the consistency aspect of it and, and, and that's incredibly Difficult. Before we move on to other lines of questioning, anyone else want to come in in relation to this? Well, can I ask about the types of complaint you get then? Because they have they have changed a bit. In general, they seem to be going down. Um, but in particular, um, look at complaints by category in relation to misconduct on individual applications, which I'd like to explain a little bit more about those types of cases. It would appear that that continues to show significant decline from 2013, 14, 97 down to in the last, uh, well, 2016, 17 anyway, uh, just 15. So, some comments on the types of cases you're getting and why you think the pattern of trend change may be, be altering. Um, 2016, 17, I think, saw um, what I hope was the final blossoming um, of complaints about disrespect. Um, they reached the highest level at that point. They've gone back down this year, um, this year to date. Um, the percentage of complaints about failure to register or declare an interest remains fairly constant. Um, from time to time, there are complaints about breach of confidentiality. Um, there tends to be a handful of these each year. They can be quite serious. Um, because it can be information about well, sensitive personal information um, or in another case the Standards Commission themselves decided it wasn't serious at all uh, it was information in a board paper which was going to be public on after the weekend um, although it was confidential at the time um, misconduct in individual applications has involved recently um, councillors making representations on their own behalf in relation to either their own planning application or a planning application which had a di direct impact on them, which of course is in wholly inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, which is significantly fallen then? Uh, which is As things stand, yes. 
do, do you think that I mean again that this is how we get beneath the figures because uh, in one respect you could say it's a good thing that complaints are falling uh, that could mean that the elected representatives are just getting it right and more consistent in their approach to public life it could mean that there's less vexatious complaints coming in or it could mean there's less awareness of the complaints mechanism and therefore people are exercising their rights to make complaints so I suppose what I'd be keen to know is what your explanation of that trend would, would be. Um, this is a guess, uh, and it feeds back to the initial line of questioning, actually. Um, I think the disrespect complaints, the blossoming of them, as I put it, um, was down to the impending local government election, and for that matter, Scottish Parliament election, um, out of the almost 100 disrespect complaints over the last four years, 57 of them relate to things that have been said in meetings. And these are people taking exception to what has been said by, in almost all cases, another councillor at a meeting. Um, the next biggest category was on social media. Um, and generally, well, there was a mixture between councillors and between councillors and members of the public. Um, misconduct and applications, there have been a couple of councillors who have chosen to make their position very clear in advance of a decision being made uh, and have then gone on to take part in the decision. And with regulatory applications, that's against the code. Um, I'm presuming they did so for political reasons. Um, in order to represent their constituents, but it's not the way the code is drawn up um, and they find themselves in trouble. Okay. Can I just, I'm going to return to that and let both of you in in relation to, I see the disrespect aspect, so let's say it's in the course of a council meeting or a parliamentary meeting or, or I mean, or on or our online Twitter feed or Facebook discussion, if there's more than one elected representative uh, in that forum, and let, let's just say, for lack of a better expression, they're all given as good as they get, but only one complaint comes in about one. Should you not really have the power to investigate all of them in that context? Would it not be be seen as odd that you didn't do that? Uh, maybe this is cowardice on my part. Um, I have no desire whatsoever to plough through three or four hours of a council meeting and make pronouncements on the appropriateness or otherwise of all of the interventions made. I, I think that has to be self-policed. Yeah, but yeah, I accept that, but it, it, by definition it's not been self-policed if one person mm. in the public gallery says, Mr Doris, Mr Simpson, Mr Gibson, never Mr Stewart of course, or, or Ms Smith, uh, was acting in a manner that's unbecoming of an MSP, they're getting reported, but actually there was a, there, there, there was a, a, a absolutely. Um, well, I mean, it's and I was encouraged to go back to the back catalogue of committee meetings and investigate them also at the same time. Uh, but the point I'm making, it would seem odd that if in the course of looking at the conduct in that meeting, you're th you're th this was a heated meeting, they were all given it a bit of welly, quite frankly, Mr Thompson, but the complaint only came in about one person, therefore we're only investigating one person. Um, the circumstances you're describing probably would not be reported as a breach. Okay. So those which are reported as a breach are circumstances in which somebody has stood out. And I can't believe I used the expression they're all given it a bit of welly. I do apologise. Mr Simpson, do you, want to con do, you want, do you want to continue on some of this? So I, w I was going to go on to uh, speak about the Code of Conduct, but I think Mr Gibson yeah, might I was, want no, to... I was just, I was just going to yeah. ask a very straightforward question. How would you would to define disrespect? Because what, what is disrespect to one person might be just ro a robust exchange of views of other. If you're not threatening someone, you're not swearing at someone, um, you know, how, how, how do you really define that? Um, it, it's a fair passionate. question and it's quite difficult to answer. Um, and it's made further complicated by um, the enhanced right of freedom of expression uh, on matters to do with politics and public administration under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, um, which comes up in these cases. Um, so we're 
There's no straightforward answer. Um, I, I don't really want to go into specific examples because I feel I would be picking individuals um, unfairly. Um, but there have been very bad taste uh, attempts at humour. Um, it's, it, it, there's, there's no straightforward answer to this. There's one European case in which uh, the person who accused the mayor of a town of embezzlement uh, was held by the court to be within their rights under Article 10. So it can even be accusations of criminal behaviour, um, which may be within the limits of freedom of expression. So the ones which I have reported tend to be personal, clearly abusive, um, or in extremely bad taste for some specific reason. But, but it's subjective rather than objective. Of course it's subjective, and thankfully it's not just my judgment, because I'm reporting to the mm. uh, Standards Commission, who don't always agree with me. But then I think that's a strength in the system, albeit there's a cost involved in it. Thank you very much for that, Mr Simpson. Yeah, um, so you, you mentioned uh, councillors who have publicly expressed a view on, uh, I'm presuming, planning applications, um, and who then go on to take a decision on that. Um, this is at the heart of the Code of Conduct for councillors, um, which uh, I understand is being potentially re revised. Um, so have you had any uh, discussions with the Scottish Government around, around that? The Scottish Government sought my views on, on one particular proposal, which was to relax. Um, I'm sorry, it's not a particularly tricky thing, but there's a dispensation for councillors appointed to certain um, other public bodies um, when they're considering things which might affect the council itself. Um, so I was consulted about that. My views were that if they were commenting on a <coughs> regulatory matter, um, in which the council had an interest, the dispensation should not allow them to participate. Um, I think that we have been talking about um, declarations of interest. Um, as I understand the code, one of its objectives is transparency and making sure that people who have a vested interest in a decision are not then participating in taking it. That's the way the law is at the moment. Okay. Well, if you go back to the... Uh the, the original thing that I mentioned where councillors will express a view uh, on a planning application um, why should why why should why should that debar them from then going on to vote it's always mystified me this about code of conduct um, well the theory the law um, requires that decisions on planning applications and for that matter other regulatory applications such as um, houses and multiple occupation, taxi licensing or whatever, um, should be based on all of the relevant facts and should not take account of any uh, matters or considerations which are not material. Um, so a councillor representing views from his or her constituency in advance of being addressed on the subjects which are material may well be reaching a view based on one side of the story. And if they then carry that forward into the decision-making process and vote on that basis, um, they may have failed to take account of some material facts. Or may not have. I mean, you could, you could express a view, um, let's say a couple, a couple of months out, when an application is first made, you express your initial view. Um, that then debars you from changing that view yeah, you know, when it comes to a meeting it's, it's an absolutely absurd situation but in it in any case um the the discussions you've had with the government appear to be have been quite narrow um so that suggests to me they're not looking at a wholesale review of the code of conduct would i be right in thinking that that's my understanding convener okay do you think they should think think, think it's time for a refresh um, there are parts of it which I think could be improved. Um, yep. What parts? Um, I have said this before. Um, I, I don't wish to take too much time. Um, the particular problems seem to me to be paragraphs 314 and 315, which relate to confidentiality, um, which are not very well expressed. 
uh, they are causing quite a lot of difficulties. Um, in part five, which is on declarations of interest, um, there are circumstances, um, well, there's a thing called the objective test, which I'm sure Mr Simpson's familiar with, which is supposed to apply when councillors are deciding whether or not they have to declare an interest. Um, it appears, I can't remember quite how many times, but it's five or six times in part five of the code, and it's expressed differently on some occasions, which I think is not at all helpful. Um, and although I haven't been asked this, um, I do think part five is quite difficult. Uh, and it's becoming more difficult as councillors are involved in other bodies where there may be conflicts of interest, uh, for example, integration joint boards. Um, there, are, <coughs> there was one error in the code. Um, it referred to uh, being reminded annually about declaring interest, whereas the regulation requires it done within a month. I believe that's one change that is going to be made. Um, I have an issue about the key principles appearing up front. The statute requires them to be there, I accept that. Uh, but they're given a prominence uh, by being at the front. Um, and a problem we had, certainly when I started in office, was that a very large percentage of the complaints just related to the key principles um, and therefore weren't specific to any of the rules which can be broken. Um, you, you cannot contravene the key principles in terms of the code, and I think that's probably right. Um, what we do now, by the way, under the initial office assessment process, if somebody simply makes a complaint that councillor so-and-so has failed to show respect under the key principles, um, we will ask them for the detail of it so that we can then decide whether it might or might not be a breach of a specific rule. So we don't just leave it there and reject it. We, we do actually explore it. Okay. Do you have anything else in relation to that? Well, the revised code um, will come before this committee um, so it sounds from what you're saying is well, perhaps we ought to be looking at the code as a whole rather than just in focusing on one narrow area. In an ideal world, yes. Right, that's our job. So yeah. You've particularly directed us to one part of the code that you think would, uh, would, would require specific attention if that's something that we were to do, which might be helpful as well. Two parts, that's the convener, um, part three, a couple of paragraphs there, and part five. The most complicated bit is probably part seven, which is the thing uh, Mr Simpson was uh, referring to in terms of the obligations on councillors in relation to planning. That, that is quite difficult. Um, and another area of difficulty which is of interest particularly to council officials is Annex C to the Code, which deals with the relationship between councillors and officials. Um, there's a particular paragraph in there, paragraph 20, which says that councillors must not comment in public on the conduct or capability of officials, which, as it stands, if you take it literally, is nonsense, because it means um, you can't say, for example, that Jane Williams has done a wonderful job um, in doing such and such. We can't say that. We can see it on the record well, right you, now. You can do so. It's not in the MSP code, yeah. um, but, it, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it is in the councillor's code, so it's interpreted as being uh, councillors should not pro publicly criticise officials. Um, that, of course, becomes difficult to reconcile with the scrutiny role um, of councillors and also with Article 10 of the ECHR. So that's a bit of a problem area. Yeah. Might it, for example, restrict councillors' ability to, to uh, scrutinise and analyse certain key documents the council's produced? Because, in effect, you could be uh, suggesting that the quality of the document produced wasn't up to a standard and didn't stand scrutiny. Could it restrict... It, that it, element? There are people who think it could. Um, I don't think legally it can because of Article 10, but um, I think it's problematic. That would certainly be worrying. Uh, Mr Simpson, is there anything else you wanted to, to, to add to that? Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. With the recent focus we've seen on harassment, on bullying and on, on harassment of a sexual nature, uh, where are you in this process and how do you think you're going to be affected uh, in the way that people may make complaints uh, and the role that you will have going forward uh, to ensure that, that the Commission has a, a, a piece of work to do with this process? Do you see yourself actively being involved in this or uh, some views and opinions would be useful? Okay. Um, the initial office assessment would identify whether the complaint appeared to be of a nature that it could be a breach of the criminal law. 
Yeah. Um, in those circumstances, um, we would refer it directly to the appropriate authorities, so we wouldn't be involved in that kind of a complaint at that stage. But we could be involved again after any criminal process, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. uh, has been concluded. Um, and it would be possible for there to be circumstances where uh, there was an absence of proof beyond um, reasonable. reasonable doubt, which is the criminal standard, um, but it could still be considered to be a complaint to be taken forward on the civil standard of um, beyond reason, of, uh, on a balance of probabilities. So it is theoretically possible that we would be involved. Um, I think the basis for any involvement, despite uh, the comments that have been made about it so far, would be the requirement to treat people with respect. Um, so uh, I wasn't wanting to go there before, but that is a, an area of disrespect, if I can put it that way, um, which could develop. Um, and also, again, going back to comments and questions that have been made earlier about things being spurious or trivial, um, I think attitudes to um, conduct of that nature are changing for the better. Uh, and things which might have been viewed as trivial or even spurious some time back would not now. Uh, I think that's a good thing. So um, it is possible that if a complaint of that nature could come forward, um, there has actually been one um, public hearing in which the nature of the disrespect was um, uh, an attempt at humour which involves sexual innuendo. Um, and the councillor in that case was suspended. Um, that's unusual in, in my experience to date, but um, I, does that give you a flavour of yeah, where I, I think I, it I, might know, go? In, as I say, in the current climate, there is bound to be issues that come forward. I have no doubt that, that you may have to deal with uh, in, in your capacity, depending on how, how, how this is perceived. And, and, and when you talk about bullying and, and you talk about the officer level and the councillor level uh, about how, how information is given out and the, the, there needs to be that cooperation between the, the councillor and the official about what information they require to have to fulfil their role. And sometimes that can get quite heated depending on the political nature of sometimes it becomes, uh, depending if that's a meeting or that's a group uh, uh, and where, where, where exchanges take place. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I think that, you know, because the, the floodgates have opened in some respects uh, in other professions uh, that there may be, be some more uh, coming our direction and this direction uh, because of the nature of the, the job that they're involved in. Uh, and that will have an implication uh, potentially for you going forward. I agree. Uh, I think it was something that it would have been inappropriate for the committee not to raise given uh, Re recent events over weeks and well actually eight months now I suppose we are just seeking um, clarity that it's not it's not missed by yourself you're following events you're making sure that your office is prepared to act as it should should there be an increase in complaints in this area and that you're sensitive to it we don't expect to hear anything other than yes of course you are but it's an opportunity for you to put some of that on the public record uh, this afternoon really Yes, of course, I, I and my office are following um, things carefully. I, I should say our role is to investigate, assess and report. Um, we have no counselling skills. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only caveat I would make at this stage. Mm -hmm. Sure. Can I ask on that? Of course you can, yes. Thanks very much. Can you, I, I'm not quite clear what you mean by that and taking it forward, but I suppose what I wanted to ask was um, councils are quite macho places. In your report you talk about representation on boards and quite rightly and that's something that we were discussing in Parliament last week and it's something that, that we can have some um, degree of control and influence on. But in terms of um, representation in councils at elected member level, then that's something that political parties, for instance, have to take on board. But because of that, I think um, there may be, with, with this now being highlighted, there will be a cultural shift, if you want to call it that. And you mentioned earlier that you would refer things directly to the police, but that would be in terms of um, sexual harassment that was criminal behaviour. But there is, of course, sexual harassment behaviour that is not criminal. And so I think when you say that, that you're not involved in counselling, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. And I would also like a bit more clarification. And I can give an example um, 
you know, myself as a as a trade union rep a number of years ago, I had to raise an issue with someone about a calendar in their office. And the way I raised that was I refused to partake of the meeting that I was invited to until the calendar was removed, at which point I would then come back. But I take it that would be something that could be referred that wouldn't be criminal behaviour, but it would be something you might deal with if yes. someone complained about something like that. And when you say counselling, what did you mean? Well, it depends. I'm simply stating that the role which I understand my office is to play is to investigate and to do so impartially. Um, I was asked previously what support we give to uh, people who make complaints. Right. Um, there's a difficulty if you're meant to be an independent investigator if you are perceived or attempting to give support to one side in the process. Um, so whilst, of course, we will investigate um, to the best of our ability, um, that's all we can do. Could, could I follow up on that? But could yeah. you give impartial um, advice in terms of signposting everyone to different organisations? Is that possible? Yes. Uh -huh. So, so you can maybe get round it that way. Just five, almost out, out, out of time. Just final couple of um, questions in relation to this particular issue. I'm absolutely right, Mr. Thompson. Uh, it, it, it's an, inv an appropriate investigatory role that you have, and an in in independent one at that. And counselling is not part of that. But w would you seek to maybe? develop links with those agencies that do provide that kind of thing to signpost individuals, both complainers and complainants, that might be something that would be appropriate or, or perhaps also just I'm, I'm checking if someone is giving a statement to, to one of your team, they would have the ability to have someone there supporting them, advocating for them in the room at that point in terms of, of that process. So. A bit of light and shade to maybe your earlier answer might be quite helpful just, just before we end this, this particular line of questioning. Um, we've already started to consider if there are or which bodies, individuals, um, we might um, think of um, having some link with in order to be able to refer people if appropriate. Um, and yes, people can be supported um, if we're interviewing them. That, that's already the position. Okay. And, and we state that if we make contact with people. I suspected that would be the case, Mr Thompson. I want to give the opportunity to put that on, on the public record here this afternoon. Are there any other questions? Are there any additional comments or observations you'd like to put, Mr Thompson, before we close this evidence No, session? thank you. Okay, well, can I thank you and your team uh, for coming along here this afternoon, also for your wait. Uh, but we do now move to agenda item three, which is draft budget scrutiny 2018-2019, which were previously agreed to take in private. So we now move to private session. Thank you.